Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for being here today. I'd like to start um, by acknowledging the traditional custodians of land on which we gather today and pay my respects to elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. For those who don't know me, my name's Emma and I'm the lymphoma care nurse based in Victoria. I'm sure most of you have received multiple emails from me over the past month um, during organising this seminar today. I'd like to start with some housekeeping. Um, most of you may have seen the bathroom facilities just straight out of the seminar to your right. Um, in the case of emergency, we'll hear um, a um, noise of some sort and we'll exit through the stairs straight out of the seminar um, to the right of where you registered. For those who are unable to use stairs, our library assistant Tim um, will direct you. Uh, some other housekeeping, if we could please pop all of our phones on silent at this time. Um, this seminar is being recorded, so if we're asking any questions, just making sure you're waiting till the microphone um, gets to you and holding it nice and close so that we can hear it on the recording. We will also be taking photos throughout the day, so if anyone um, doesn't want their photo taken, please let myself or Erica here at the front know, and we'll make sure um, that we don't take your photo today. So going on to the outline of today, we'll be having our first two speakers, which will take us through to midday. At midday, we'll have an hour break um, with a light lunch. Our lunch will be held in the Riverdex area, which is on level one. So you go straight down the elevators that you came up and to your left-hand side. Um, we'll then have our final speaker and conclude at about 2 p.m. today. So without further ado, I'd like to um, introduce our first speaker, Andrea Hendon. Dr. Andrea Hendon is an early career clinical scientist. She is currently a research officer in the Translational Cancer Immunotherapy Laboratory, developing CAR T cell therapies for blood cancers. Her PhD was completed in the Bone Marrow Transplantation Laboratory at QIMR, where she studied factors controlling graft-versus-host disease and graft-versus-leukemia effects. Dr. Hendon also holds a position as a staff specialist in the Haematology and Bone Marrow Transplantation Unit at the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital. Her current research spans both clinical research and translational and basic science research, with the goal of ultimately improving outcomes for patients with malignant haematological orders. Can we please welcome Andrea? Um, so firstly to say thank you for having me today. It's a real privilege to be able to talk to you and for you have taken time out of your weekend. Um, so yeah, a little bit of me, uh, my background just to start off with so you might understand sort of some of my perspectives. So very much I'm a working haematologist. I do clinic at least two days a week at the Royal Brisbane and at North Lakes, but I also do have a bit of a research interest as well. And certainly car therapy coming from the research sphere into the clinical sphere is probably one of the more exciting things that's happened during my career. Um, and so I'm just going to talk you through what I think some of the really key issues. Car therapy has generated a lot of interest, I think, compared to some of our other, you know, drugs and other developments that have happened in haematology. It's certainly got a lot more media interest. It is somewhat fantastic, I think, when we think about um, exactly what it takes to, to, to do this therapy. So I'm just going to try and walk you through those um, steps and some of the issues as well. Um, and importantly, obviously, as someone who does research and talks, I do receive some, some funding, although all of the advice that I'll give you today is not based on any of that. Um, so this is what I'm going to step you through. So what is CAR-T therapy? I'm just going to start for the basics, assuming that none of you necessarily know much, although I appreciate that some of you might already know quite a bit. Um, where can you get it? Um, because it's not something that's available in all treatment centres um, in Australia or even the world, um, who can get it? And I think that's one of the key issues at the moment. It's essentially a pretty limited resource at the moment. Um, what can we expect as an outcome? Um, and where to next? And then very happy, I think these are, this is a luxuriously long speaking spot. I don't normally get nearly this long to talk to people. So very happy to do a lot of Q&A at the end. So what is CAR-T therapy? So this is a nice diagram that actually comes from, from one of the um, summary documents that was sort of submitted to the government to actually get CAR-T funded in Australia. So believe it or not, we actually, we start with our patient. 
Um, we take, we do a process called leukapheresis, which is essentially removing white blood cells from the bloodstream. So I always explain this, it's a little bit, some people will understand what dialysis is. It's a machine where you, you, you sit there, they'll either put two big drips, one in each arm, one's an in, one's an out of the machine. The blood is filtered through the machine and it has the capacity to separate the the, the white blood cells in this situ in this scenario from the rest of the blood. So the patient gets the rest of the blood back. They don't become anemic or 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 afterwards. Um, and then we have this sort of uh, bag of white blood cells. This white blood this bag of white blood cells then in fact gets sent to a manufacturing facility where we use genetic engineering really to reprogram the function of these cells. Now these are normally immune cells whose job is to recognize and kill uh, virus infected cells and bacteria and other things that are foreign to our body. But in fact, in this scenario, we're reprogramming them to be able to do the same and kill lymphoma cells. So this sort of taking, these are one of the first therapies that's really taken genetic engineering into a cancer therapy context. So once we've reprogrammed a small number of these CAR T cells, they then need to be grow, grown up into uh, bigger numbers so that we've got a good dose of the of the uh, of the therapy to give to a patient. There's lots of quality control, as you can imagine. We have to make sure these cells are healthy, well, that they function and that they're sterile. There's a certain list of, of quality criteria that have to be met um, for the product in order to be released. And then these cells make their way back from the manufacturing facility to the treatment centre. Before we give the CAR T cells to the patient, we have to give a low dose of chemotherapy. We call that lymphodepleting chemotherapy or low dose chemotherapy. It's not intended in any way to treat the lymphoma, um, although it may be drugs that people have received as part of lymphoma treatment regimens in the past. But in this context, we're giving the lymph lymphodepleting therapy to really make a space in the immune system so that these new CAR T cells can come in and expand in number because, as I said, compared to the very small number that are genetically reprogrammed, they grow up once in the lab and then we give them to the patient and we want them to grow up in number again so that they're able to kill the lymphoma. So it's obviously a very complicated process and I think some of the, some of the really big issues at the moment are that at the current status of the um, commercially sort of funded products that are available in Australia, these manufacturing facilities are in the United States. So this process is a plane ride <laughs> and it's got to be uh, temperature controlled. So there's obviously a lot of logistics in that part of it. Um, and so that also means that this process from the leukophoresis to having a cell product to give to a patient is about four to six weeks. And that's really important because it does actually mean that sometimes this waiting period can make it not a good choice for treating some people's lymphoma because we have to have a patient who's not too unwell to, to go through that. And I'll explain a little bit more going forward. Um, and so that all sounds, as I said, sort of fantastical, wonderful in, in some ways that we can either do that, but how is this actually an effective lymphoma treatment? So this is just a little diagram showing the normal way that immune cells kill, can kill tumour cells. So T cells are these ones, that's why we call them CAR T. CAR stands for chimeric antigen receptor, so it's the genetic reprogramming that we do, and the T cell is the type of cell that we do it to. So normally, a T cell has to see like a, a combination of lock and key mechanisms with any cell that it wants to kill. It uses this thing called the, the T, TCR, the T cell receptor, and then it has to see some markers on the cell to know if it's a, a self cell or a non-self cell, and then it's usually got some other binders that will then help actually kill its target. And the problem with this, this works really well for sort of, as I said, virus infected cells and bacteria and things, but tumours are very good at maybe hiding away some of those locks and keys. So the reason CAR is so effective is it actually, this receptor can bypass a lot of the, those requirements. So as soon as it sees its, its lock, um, the CD19 or the key, if you prefer to call that, that's the target of the, T, of, of the CAR T cell, that's on all 
lymph, on most lymphomas that we treat with CAR T cells. And so it can kill without the need for this, this MHC molecule and all these other sort of bypass products that tumours use to, use to hide from the immune system. So that's its really, um, that's its, its immunological power. And that was the really important part of sort of scientific engineering that allowed us to have CAR T cells. That's actually been something that immunologists have been working on since the 80s. So it's not really a, a new concept, but finally we got to a, to a phase where we could have this product. But equally, some of the really important things at the moment is all of the CAR T ther therapies that we have target this CD19. Um, and you do need to have that CD19 on your tumour in order for the CAR T cell to be effective. So this is a real, this is good for us in haematology and particularly for patients with lymphoma because a lot of lymphomas have this CD19 on the surface. Some healthy cells have CD19 on the surface as well, and that's um, B cells or antibody producing cells. But I always I sort of liken it a little bit to like wisdom teeth or an appendix. You can, although it's not ideal not to have any B cells, you can live um, a life with without B cells. So we're lucky in lymphoma that this CD19, we can afford to effectively kill all cells with CD19 on them, and that includes the lymphoma cells. But it does. it is one of the reasons why CAR T cell therapy is not available for all patients with blood cancers yet, and certainly one of the main reasons that we haven't yet seen lots of success in, in non-blood cancers, so in other sorts of cancers. But this is obviously a really active area of research. Um, there are trials now looking at not just CD19, so looking at things like CD20 and CD22, which are other markers on lymphoma cells. Um, some of those can be on leukaemias. Uh, and equally, if we can find some targets that are on solid tumours that don't mean that if we kill off the healthy cells with that, then we might even be able to see CAR T cells be effective in other cancers. So I'm already going to just stop there and pause for a minute. Does that kind of make sense? Can I explain that differently for anyone? Because I think that's really fundamental then to understanding some of the, the issues. So as I said, what, what do I see as some of the, you know, CAR T's great, and we'll talk about how effective it can be later on. Um, but what are the, some of the potential problems? So look, I've already, I've already talked about these waiting periods and disease control. Um, so for some patients, waiting six weeks isn't feasible. And so their patients where CAR T cell might not be the best therapy for them. We also have um, effects, so at the moment in Australia, and I'll go through in a bit more detail shortly exactly who can access it, but essentially almost everyone will have had other lymphoma treatments before. And so you can imagine that there are some patients for which even collecting a healthy starting cell product to make a CAR T can be an issue. And so we have to think particularly about this drug bendamustine, which may be, a, which may be part of some people's chemotherapy regimens. We have to stay at least sort of six to nine months after the last dose of some of these other therapies. So that can further, com oops, that can sort of further combound some of these uh, waiting period issues depending on what your other therapies have been. Um, I think the other really important issue is, is the, the, the non-lymphoma parts of this. So that's all great. I've talked a lot about lymphoma and disease, but what about the whole patient? Um, I'll go on in a moment about where you can get this, but it's not everywhere. Um, equally, it requires an inpatient stay for at least two weeks and then another two weeks of staying very close by your CAR T centre where someone's able to be a carer for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so that often means that the patient and their family have to relocate. That's a really big impact on your life. Equally, if you're thinking about this as your next therapy, you might have, there's obviously a lot of hope that this is going to be a cure. It isn't for everyone. So there's a lot of issues around that as well. And equally, follow-up requirements. Um, so you would need to still remain in contact with your CAR T centre quite frequently in the in the early weeks to months after you have this therapy. We do try and do shared care then with a lot of the places where people have had their primary therapy. Um, but equally, we have some requirements as a CAR T treating centre that, in fact, we need to keep collecting data on patients for up to fifteen years afterwards. Now, that's not that's not a research function; that's a, a requirement. So I think they're important things to know about as well. So I'll, I'll just move on to, so I've already touched on the fact that there are some significant logistical issues here. So where can you get CAR T therapy in Australia at the moment? And at the moment, I'm just talking about places that can provide funded 
standard of care access to CAR-T. We'll, we'll talk a bit more about clinical trials coming up. But as it stands at the moment, there are only six hospitals in Australia that can deliver this therapy. So we can at the Royal Brisbane Hospital in Brisbane. There are two centres in Sydney, Westmead and the RPA, um, Peter Mack and the Alfred in Victoria, and Fiona Stanley Hospital in Perth. So obviously we're not currently servicing a lot of Australia where patients can get CAR-T close to them. And so that's why I said those logistical issues, how can we get people there? We have to book slots for that leukophoresis. That's not just something we can do any day of the week. We have to time it with previous chemotherapy. So it becomes quite complex about how we can actually get this. And I've just put this picture up. So this is we do actually get on better. This was a photo taken during COVID, which is why we're all standing at least a metre and a half apart. Um, but this is sort of some of the key members of our CAR-T team at the Royal Brisbane. So Dr Curley is the director of our department. Um, Nilu is our CAR, was, at, well, was our CAR fellow at the time, but one of our consultants now. Dr Tay is also one of our key CAR doctors and does some really interesting clinical trial work. Angela is one of our cancer care coordinators and particularly for the CAR-T patients. And then we've got people who work in the lab in quality. So We've got a really great team, I think, and we really try and address a lot of these issues with CAR. So, as I said, where can you get it? This is who can get it. And I think this is one of the real sticking points in Australia. So when CAR-T, the, the process for uh, approval of a drug or any medicine is that um, the company make it has to do some clinical trials to prove it's effective. Um, then they can come to a country, and so for Australia, the, the body that they come to for CAR-T therapy is called the Medical Services Advisory Committee. And that's a group of, of doctors um, and statisticians and experts who are able to evaluate um, how effective a therapy is, how much it costs, and essentially can we how can we provide this to patients in our jurisdiction, um, and equally maybe if we can't provide it to everybody who is likely to get the greatest benefit. So I'm very happy that I've never been invited or will have anything to do with being on the MSAC committee. I think that would be an incredibly difficult job to do. Um, but they are certainly the body that decides how, the, how CAR-T therapy gets funded in Australia. So at the moment, the MSAC has said that they will provide CAR-T therapy for paediatric and young adults, that's up to 25 years of age, with acute lymphoblastic leukaemia. And there's one product, um, Kim Raya, which is from Novartis, for that indication. Um, patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma or the, the related entities, primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma and transformed follicular lymphoma are also able to access CAR-T. Um, and there's a choice of two products there, um, the Kim Raya or Yes Carter, and Yes Carter comes from Kite Gilead. And just recently, we've had approval for mantle cell lymphoma with a new product called Tecartis, also um, from Kite Gilead. But it's not that simple. Not everyone with those diagnoses can get it. So these, I've just cut and pasted these off the MSAC website. I don't expect you to uh, read them. And I'll go through some of the key points, though. But really, these are the indications um, for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma that you can access either the AxiCell, um, which is the, the Yes Carter product, or the Kim Raya product. They're essentially identical for, for each product for this indication. Um, I've just pulled out what I think are the really key points. So essentially at the moment, it's for patients in their third line of therapy. So they have to have had at least an upfront regimen of chemotherapy in most institutions in Australia for diffuse large B cell lymphoma. This will be a, a regimen called RCHOP, um, which has a rituximab and then a combination of chemotherapies. Importantly, one of them is usually an anthracycline. At the time that you're considering giving, that they then have to, sorry, they, they then have, so that's their first line of therapy. Um, in most centres in Australia, if you then relapse and go on to your second line of therapy, you will have a salvage chemotherapy, and a lot of patients may also be ordered, um, uh, offered an autograft. So that's a, a transplant where cells from the patient are collected and given back to the patient after high dose chemotherapy. So it's only then if you relapse after that second line that you're eligible to get CAR T cell therapy in Australia at the moment. So that's one, I think that's one thing really important. We know from a lot of research and clinical trials going on in the world that in fact CAR T cells are probably effective earlier on in the piece. 
Um, and, and generally, this concept of using immune therapies, uh, are prob we believe that they're probably, if patients have not responded well to chemotherapy in the past, that immune therapies are probably a better way to treat them. So, I mean, as a clinician, I would love to have access, and we've certainly pursued clinical trials, which will hopefully give us access to CAR-T earlier in therapy. Um, certainly in other places in the world at the moment, you can access CAR-T, say it's second line, but at the moment in Australia, it's third line. Um, equally, as I said, patients have to be well enough at the time that they're going to receive the therapy. I'll talk a bit more about infection, but that's one of the big things that we can't, if people have got bad pneumonias or fungal disease or something at the time, it's not, not a great idea to try and give them CAR-T therapy then. You've also sort of got to be well enough, and we use this score called the ECOG. It's the Eastern Collaborative Oncology Group. You don't need to remember that, but basically it's trying to give an indication of how fit a patient is. And for a lot of our immune therapies, including transplant and CAR, we know that actually the people who tend to do better are the people who are fitter going into it. So this is part of trying to pick patients who are ECOG 0 or 1. And if you read through these descriptions, it's actually relatively restrictive. So 0, zero is... is, is completely well. No impact of your disease on your ability to do anything. You can do uh, strenuous activity. Uh, ECOG 1 is only a restriction in strenuous activity, but pretty much you can still do everything. Um, so if you're, for example, in hospital or in bed, you're almost automatically excluded. Now we try and consider that if that ECOG is because of the disease, we're allowed to say, okay, we'll, we'll assume that if, if it wasn't, but if you've got any other significant medical condition that means that, for example, you need assistance for activities of daily living, we have to be very careful about that. Equally, have to have, there's some thresholds for having good kidney function, heart function, lung function. And this rider that we have to be able to effectively manage your lymphoma through that four to six week process, because we don't want to start collecting a CAR T cell therapy and have a patient who's too sick to get it at the end of it. So although we, we, we have this access in Australia, actually all of a sudden, if you think about all of those things, we do actually, it's actually a pretty narrow band of patients who that we're able to give standard of care CAR for. And I've just put this up. This is the relatively new indications for mantle cell lymphoma. So similarly, there you're only eligible to have this therapy if you've had a set number of treatments before. So that includes, again, an anthracycline, bendamustine, or cytarabine. So these are pretty standard up front therapies at diagnosis in Australia. And then treatment with a BTK inhibitor. So that's drugs like ibrutinib. Um, or Imbruvica or, or members of that class. So again, it's not something that anyone can get whenever they would like to, or even when their doctors would like to, they really have to fulfill this criteria. And there are also some caveats for both diffuse large B cell and mantle about involvement in the brain, and I'll talk about why that's important shortly. So as I've said, you've already heard, I do have a research interest. I've talked about clinical trials. Why are they such a good thing to think about? So particularly for CAR, it, it may mean that we can access CAR for in places that are not delivering standard of care. As I said, the MSAC has in intentionally limited the number of sites um, that can deliver CAR in Australia. We might be able to treat um, conditions other than those or at a line of therapy other than those that are currently funded. But the writer is always clinical trials are often answering, trying to answer a very specific question. So they may not be suitable for all patients, but I always encourage people, ask your doctors at your treating sites, are there, are there any clinical trials that I might be suitable for? You know, and then you can talk through how that might fit with it. Now, I haven't written it down because I can't, I don't actually know. It's, it's actually a, an industry secret, the number, but why all this limitation? Ultimately, it comes down to cost. So these are very expensive therapies. You can imagine that whole process, leukophoresis, sending them off, genetically re-engineering, all of that. It makes these products extremely expensive. And as I said, I don't know the actual price the government pays for every CAR-T therapy, but it's probably in the order of somewhere between 500 to 700,000 Australian dollars. Um, so that is why we have all these restrictions on who we can give it to. Um, there are lots of clinical trials, including one at our site, that have really tried to do this for a, a much 
uh, are, are lesser cost essentially. So they're CAR T cells that we manufacture on site at the Royal Brisbane Hospital, which certainly reduces the cost. We've been to able to collaborate with someone who actually makes the vector, use our own staff and equally make it on site. So those, you know, there are lots of places in the world that have had what we call that approach to sort of academic or on-site manufacturing. And that's something that I think we'll see a lot more of. Um, but yes, ultimately a lot of these restrictions are due to cost. So again, I might just stop there. Does that raise any questions for people at the moment? Or yes. Oh. <laughs> if you've been involved in a previous clinical trial with other drugs, does that have any impact on then receiving um, CAR T therapy down the track? The short answer is it will depend on the particular clinical trial. So each clinical trial, as I said, will generally aim to answer a specific question and they may therefore be interested or disinterested in including patients who have had particular other therapies. So at the moment, a lot of the CAR-T clinical trials will preclude people who've had another CAR-T on a clinical trial um, or other similar immune therapies. But they're not all the same. So some are, are, are more inclusive in, the, in their what we call inclusion and exclusion criteria. So some will say we will accept any patients who've had any prior lympho lymphoma therapies. They might want to know what they are as part of the data collection. Uh, but ultimately, it is specific to the clinical trial. Apologies, I'm going to make you go back a couple of slides. That's no, all right. I don't, you don't need to go back. Okay. You're pretty confident you'll probably be able to answer. Um, and forgive me if I get some of the terminology wrong That's and all right. correct me if. Um, so, I guess the first question I've got is uh, in regard to the lymphoma aspect, there was a couple of or multiple drug options that were at play with the CAR T um, in the, the, I can't remember the slide aspect, but you went through and in terms of what you've, treatments you have to have had before no, to, to no, qualify? These, the, or? The, these were the drug options, I think, through program. Is that correct? Um, oh, I'm not quite certain. Do you mean the different products? Oh, yeah, which yeah. product? Yes. Yeah, which, which, which CAR-T product you might be suitable for? Yes. Uh, yes. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. That's where I... Yeah, <laughs> cool. Um, I, I guess my question is how how is that determined um, in regard to... like So is that a... A clinical decision based on, yeah. on, on so, markers of some description or, yeah. So both, so the only, I should say, I'll start by saying the only only space that we have choice in at the moment is really in that diffuse large B-cell lymphoma slash transformed follicular PBMCL. Um, so for that group of patients, we do have a choice between um, uh, the teaser cell product and the axi cell product. Um, they have slightly different toxicity profiles so that will often be the key reason we will choose one over the other but essentially that's a decision your your CAR T physician or your you know your, your treating doctor will make. Okay um, so the next one once again so it's around these markers all right so you you, you spoke to marker 19 that yep. obviously is on the CT. Yep. Um, my understanding and I can't remember the is it a P53 marker when ah. you're going through chemo etc. Yep. All right. So uh, my, I don't want to be overly specific about my situation because everyone's on a journey here, mm. okay? But um, I'm in relapse mode because my markers didn't respond, I don't think, effectively to mm. the, the ARCHOP yep. sort of cy cycling, right? My question, I guess, is in the CAR-T, uh, is there a likelihood or a potential of risk around a similar outcome where the, the 19 marker potentially doesn't respond similar to, say, other markers in your body, yep. irrespective of the science or, the, or what's being applied? So the first thing I'll say is the CD19, I use that lock and key mechanism for a reason. So the CD19 that's, is something that it's a, what we call a surface marker. Um, I'll just bring the picture back up. So it's really, it's like, it's like something that's on the surface of the cell that says the identity of the cell. Um, so certainly you have to have that, other, you have to have CD19 on, on it, otherwise the car won't be able to see it. If, the, if you've got the wrong key for the lock, you won't be able to, it won't be able to recognise and kill a cell. Um, so, so that's certainly, but CD19 isn't a marker that tends to uh, indicate how a cancer is likely to respond to a treatment. So the P53 that you talk about is one of those, and that's more to do with the inherent... Um, 
um, biology of the cancer cell. Unfortunately, P53 is a relatively one that does is more often associated with treatment resistance, particularly to chemotherapies. So, so from what you've told me, that 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 is a common theme, and and often a group of patients who we will see referred for immunotherapies earlier. Uh, but when it comes to, as I said, at the moment, all of the commercial products need you to have CD19 on your lymphoma to, for it to work. As I said, it's an area of really active research. We've got one clinical trial that's just about open, so at least we'll include patients with CD20, but they're still uh, markers that are likely to be on the same type of cell. So I think in terms of thinking about the markers and predictors of response, um, certainly there's not as many... Uh, years of evidence to tell us, for example, which of those tumour biology markers, like P53, for example, are more or less likely to respond to this therapy or other therapies. But the, the surface markers, the actual target for the car, is a bit more of a black and white. We really want it to be there for it to work. Does that answer your Absolutely. question? I, and I only have one other, I guess, which is a, a variation on a theme of the previous question, which is, given the, the potential for relapse mentality post a particular preventative cycle like a yep. first round chemo does this have the same propensity for that potentially where you may get a short term indicator of success and then a potential uh, a relapse aspect I guess yep. is what I'm suggesting so I'll talk about the post car outcomes and there's two things two things I would say to that um Certainly, we, we will look at response to CAR early. Our standard after we give the treatment, we look at responses at day 30. Um, and I'll talk a little bit through about the sort of duration of response. But I think the big difference between this and another therapy is that once you have this in your body, it can live potentially for a very long time. Um, so because these are your own T cells, yes, we've fiddled around, we've genetically engineered them, but they are your own T cells. So they won't, they shouldn't be rejected in the long term. So the same way that you can have a vaccination and generate an immune response and have a long-lived cell that will remember that infection and recognise it down the track, these T cells can potentially do the right the same thing. So they, we call, I mean, some people like to use that analogy of a living drug. So they're potentially there for a long time. And if that lymphoma tries to relapse, if they're still there, they may be able to recognise and kill it off. So we do tend to see a different sort of um, timeline of response to CAR compared to, for example, a chemotherapy or something that's more a put it in and then it's gone. Um, but equally, how long a CAR T cell persists in any one patient is quite variable. So some of the very first patients treated, treated with CAR T cells, they're getting up to 20 years now, and there's a few of them that we can still find some CAR T cells circulating. But actually for about 70% of patients, the CAR T cells may well be gone 18 months to two years after we infuse them. But that may be long enough to have eradicated the lymphoma. So that's a, that's a hard one to answer, particularly on an individual patient um, context, but yeah, it gives you, gives you an idea of some of the themes. Hello, look, I could be jumping the gun here. I'm interested to see how many people have had reactions from the genetically modified white cells and whether that does jeopardise the success or you can manage it. So the reactions are actually, in terms of infusion reactions, so things that happen after we infuse the cells, maybe I want to do, if you don't mind holding that question, because I think I've got some parts of it, um, we don't tend to see these cells rejected, though, or have a reaction. The genetic modification tends to be pretty well tolerated, I suppose, is, 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 is the short answer, but I'll, I'll expand on that a little bit. Just, um, just before you jump, I, before, because it's very uh, aligned, yep. the last question I've got at this stage is just, I am. I don't understand properly. So I've been, everything that's been told to me, you either it's a, a win lose sum game. All right, with lymphoma. What I don't understand is this suppression mentality. And you were talking a minute ago about once the cells are infused into the body, there is potentially some still some capacity for them to identify. Um, so your tumor spread may be um, not as aggressive potentially, if that's the right way of referring to it. Um, and is that is there any scope or space that there, that, that we could occupy a world at some stage where, like in, in this immuno world, and I, for me, my mind harkens to HIV AIDS mentality, where years ago it was an immediate death sentence. Now mm -hmm. we're able to take any antivirals, basically, you know, by time, all right? Yep. Is there a scope in the future? And I know that one of the speakers is talking about a vaccine space, et cetera, but is there a space around where there could be 
some extension of this or some augmentation of the CAR T that maybe you don't get cured, but maybe you get time? I, I, I know you talked before about not wanting to see the outcomes, but actually I think that's the answer to your question. So I might show you. So we do believe that CAR T probably has, we're starting to feel confident um, that CAR T probably has some curative capacity for some patients. Um, so, yeah, so they're all really good questions and thank you. I think it's always nice to break it up rather than just listening to me go on and on. So I think this slide really does sort of put the paradigm and this is about, well, so all of what we've spoken about, why do we think this is, is worth the effort? So these are currently, so we've got now sort of good five-year outcomes from some of the original clinical trials that, that, that allowed CAR-T to be registered and reimbursed, particularly in North America. They're a bit ahead of us. Um, so this is from for the product um, AxiCaptogene, so AxiCell, that's the Yes Carter product. So I haven't put one of these for every single product, but I think this is probably the, the, the paradigm that we're working under at the moment. So these are generally, this was from a trial called Zuma one Don't ask me how they come up with these names. This is just a picture in, in, in diagram form of what the car T cell, like the car construct actu actually looks like. And so this is what we call a survival curve. So you can see this is the percentage of patients alive at any one time. So clinical trials obviously start at 100% with all of the patients who went on the trial alive. And then we're counting down the time. And the reduction in that curve is obviously the number of people surviving. Um, so you can see here that we probably at the moment sitting around, you know, 42% of all people who started on this trial alive at five years. So that, and I'll show you some old, older data and why we think this is so much better. Um, but equally, what we do tend to see as we're getting out to these longer time points is that, for example, you can see here that very few patients are relapsing or dying of their lymphoma. So I think if you put this in words, it doesn't work for everyone. And certainly there are some people's lymphoma who, for whatever reason, maybe it, it, it's able to hide from the car, maybe the car doesn't expand and, and stay around long enough. Sometimes the tumour can start hiding, it gets clever, it starts hiding that CD19 and the car can't see it anymore. There's a whole range of reasons that can happen. But it doesn't work for everyone, but for those it does work for, they tend to live a long time lymphoma free. And why do we think, look, obviously that's not perfect. I'd love to see the perfect survival curve is a straight line right here across the top. But we think this is pretty good because if we look at the old data, so this is when we had just chemotherapy and autographs, um, this is what the survival curve looked like. And if we split it up into people who'd had two lines of chemotherapy at least before their autograph. So this is sort of the patients we're allowed to treat with CAR in Australia at the moment. That's what their survival curve looks like. So I think that looks like a pretty significant improvement. So that's why we think it's really important. Having said that, CAR is not perfect. So coming on to some of your questions about reactions and what's, you know, when it doesn't go well, what happens? So this is a very different treatment paradigm to what we've had before. And I've, I've split the um, adverse events or, or problems um, into early and late. So because we're putting this supercharged immune cell into your system that when it sees its target, it tends to grow up in numbers really fast. It releases a lot of what we call cytokines or immune signaling molecules. These are the same sorts of things that when you have a cold or flu, make you feel really rotten and put your fever up. And so that can happen kind of on turbo after we put the, the CAR T cell in. And we call that cytokine release syndrome. So this is one of the early potential toxicities or side effects we can see after the CAR T cell infusion. Um, and that's something that we don't tend to see with other sorts of therapies. Equally, um, so the good thing is we understand the biology of this pretty well now. And if we start to see early signs of it, particularly a fever um, in patients who've had a CAR T cell, we can jump in, we can give them drugs that try and block off some of those inflammatory signals. So we see that a lot these days, if you look at the early trials, cytokine release syndrome could be a reason that patients got really sick and even ended up in intensive care after their CAR T cells. That happens pretty infrequently now, probably around 5 to 7% of people with really severe but lots of people will get early. So lots of people might get a fever, need some drugs, um, but it tends to be more manageable and, and almost everyone will recover from it apart, apart from those people who get very severe versions. 
there's sort of a, 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 a in people, patients who get CRS, there's this potential for CRS of the brain, if you like, I think is the best way to explain it. Someone came up with all these great acronyms. Um, ICANS really just rolls off the tongue, immune effector cell associated neurotoxicity. Um, but yeah, essentially this is like CRS when it affects, affects the brain. And again, in its, in its um, mild form, people can be a little bit confused. We actually measure people's handwriting. Um, and some of the early signs can be that their handwriting looks a bit funny or they can't spell. Um, again, can be very mild. We try and intervene. We don't have as many specific um, antidotes for, for ICANS as we do for CRS. But, you know, occasionally some people can get really sick and they could be in a coma and, again, need to go in intensive care. That's pretty rare and it's certainly becoming rarer as we understand um, CAR-T therapy more and intervene earlier, but it's still a potential. And this, so when I went back to why everyone has to have a carer 24-7, these early things, these are why we keep you in hospital for two weeks after you have your CAR-T treatment so that hopefully we can find that early, treat it early and have you well and out of hospital. But particularly for the ICANs, it tends to happen a little bit later. So the classic onset for CRS is literally in the first few days after you have the CAR-T cell therapy. But the ICANs can be sort of two weeks later. Now, if you've otherwise been well, we might be happy to let you out of the hospital. But equally, early ICANs might not be something that a patient has any much appreciation of themselves when it's happening to. So that's where the care is really important. We teach people to do this screening score called the ICE score that includes doing their handwriting. And so that's part of the requirement that even for the couple of weeks that you're first out of hospital, you have to be staying near the Royal Brisbane Hospital, you have to have a carer 24-7 so that we can pick up these and treat them early. Equally, let's say you get through that first month, then we still have some other potential problems. So infection I've bolded here, that's a really big one. So I said before, the CD19 is on some normal cells and they're normally your antibody producing cells. Now, rituximab and some of the other therapies we use in, in lymphoma have this as a potential as well, but CAR T cells are so good at killing B cells that this infection risk does seem to be more. And it can happen late and it can be quite a different range of infections that we genuinely see. They can be bacterial infections like pneumonia. They could be viral infections and COVID's been a bit of a problem in this population. Um, but as are other respiratory viruses and other non-respiratory viruses like a thing called CMV or cytomegalovirus. And then for some patients, it has this paradoxical effect on bone marrow function where it actually reduces all the blood cell counts. So it, someone gave it this great title. This is only a new one. It just used to be, we used to call postcard cytopenias, but now it's <coughs> immune effector cell associated hematoxicity, ICAT, just again rolls off the tongue. Um, but for some people, this means they can have quite low blood counts for up to six to 12 months afterwards. And particularly the platelets can be problematic. People might still be needing to have platelet transfusions on a week weekly or fortnightly basis. Um, so this can be a problem as well, even if the car does a great job for the lymphoma. And equally, relapse. The, the curve I showed you before does say that obviously for some people this is not the be-all and end-all of, of their lymphoma therapy. And this is a really tricky space at the moment because it, 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 by nature of the patients that we can treat, the patients who relapse often have really difficult disease to treat. So at the moment this is a really space that we need better tools. There are certainly some emerging, some other immune therapies that are actually antibody, not CAR T cell mediated. So there's a lot of um, work in these sort of this bite space as, as, as therapies. There are people trying to design better cars that might work after a CD19 car have failed. And certainly this is one where we really actively look for clinical trials for patients in this space, because to be honest, the treatments that we can just prescribe in a normal clinic don't have a great success rate. Um, so again, I might just stop there before I just sort of go through some of this sort of forward thinking things. Does that bring up any questions for, for some people or... Thank you. Great presentation. The, um, is there a case to be made on the relapse front there to, if, if you're cooking up a whole bunch of um, CAR T cells to maybe stick them on ice for a couple of years for the next round? Yeah. So good question. Um, at the moment, the manufacturing process will, is such that for, for, for pretty much all patients, only one dose will be made. Um, the, the dosing is actually based on a, on a per kilo, so it's a weight-based dose. Um, and, and while in what we might have a moderate excess for some people, we tend to give that in one go. 
The reason that we think going back to giving the same car again uh, is not going to be the right strategy for most patients is probably thinking about why the cancer has relapsed afterwards. So in a lot of cases, that's because it either the car didn't work in the first place. So going back to something that doesn't work is not a great strategy. Um, in some cases, it's because the cancer no longer expresses that CD19. Um, so going back to a CD19 car isn't going to be effective. Going back to your question before, in fact, there are a small proportion of patients... I'll just go back to oh yeah, this picture. So there are parts of this genetic construct that actually come from mouse sequences. Unfortunately, a lot of medical research gets done in mice first. Um, so there are parts of this that can come from mouse. So some people can create antibodies against their car because it is something foreign to your own immune system. The rates of that are reasonably low, but it's something that we do appreciate is probably important. So there are certainly some newer cars that are being what's called fully humanised. So they'll be made out of completely human genetic sequences to try and avoid that. But again, if, you've, if, 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 either your, if your car was never effective at killing for some reason, if you are lost your CD19 or you've got an antibody, going back to the same treatment is probably not likely to be effective for you. So it's generally not something that we've looked at. But I think looking at cars that, t that go to another target, so rather than nine, if it stopped expressing 19, maybe you can go for 20 or 22. Um, or if um, maybe it's better to go for a different strategy altogether. You know, if, if T some, some of these lymphomas become resistant, even they can be resistant to chemotherapy, they can be resistant to T cell killing. So maybe if a car hasn't worked, you're better to go to a different strategy. So it becomes what I'd call a very, a very personalised patient choice. You want to try and find out what, why it didn't work and then offer an approach that's more likely to be successful. Any other questions for this point? How soon after stem cell transplant can a patient have CAR T? Good question. Um, so there are some minimum requirements. I mentioned the bendamustine before. There are some minimum um, periods of time after other therapies that we have to wait. And equally, we need to have enough of lymphocytes to collect. And ideally, we want those lymphocytes to be pretty healthy. There, the T cells ability to kill tumour probably uh, does have something to do with what we say how fit they were or how, how functional they were. Um, so everyone might be a little bit different, but equally, if we've if patients have had an autologous transplant, so cells from themselves, if the blood counts have recovered sufficiently, there's not, not sort of necessarily a long waiting period. Um, if patients have had an allogeneic transplant where the cells come from another donor, and that's not frequently done early, it's not a common scenario for us to be in, but there are some particular, um, the immune system tends to be slower to recover after an allograft, and so we might have to wait longer to have a sufficient number of lymphocytes to actually make a CAR product. Um, in the early days of CAR, we worried there were some patients where we couldn't make an effective CAR product, we didn't get enough, we couldn't get healthy cells out of it. That's an uncommon reason not to be able to proceed with CAR, but it does relate to how much treatment people have had before. And I think more importantly, when, pe when patients relapse, some people need immediate therapy. Um, they can't wait to come and see a doctor at the Royal if that's not where they've been treated before, wait for an apheresis slot and have their CAR made. So often patients will need another therapy and then we have to wait for the washout period for that before we can make it. So distance to, to, from autograft hasn't generally been a big barrier for us. I think it's more then about the relapse and how we can fit around that. <clears throat> Yeah, so um, the, the bendamustine is particular. It just seems to take, it has a particular effect on the lymphocytes and it means we have to wait more like six to 12 months. Beam doesn't have bendamustine, but um, recovery afterwards, you know, can be a little bit delayed. So probably the biggest factor we'd use is we'd look at the lymphocyte count and try and work out how high is it. Some people do recover very quickly, so... So, yeah, so, so look... Obviously, we've talked through a lot of issues there. I still think CAR is an amazing opportunity. It really has changed the way um, we treat lymphomas. Um, when I was a very early baby haematologist, Erica might remember that, um, I, I, I think one thing that we talked about was may, maybe in, in people like my career, we might move to a point where we no longer um, give patients a lot of chemotherapy. I'd love to be in an era where we give no chemotherapy, um, but certainly CAR is a big change in the way we do it and certainly reducing chemotherapy. 
I've crossed out myeloma here because, in fact, it was only just yesterday that the information became publicly available. There are some CAR Ts designed for myeloma. And I know this is a lymphoma forum, but I think it's important to mention it's just been chosen not to be funded for patients with myeloma in Australia. Um, and so... I think that's still important to know because in, a, in the car field, we're very excited. We'd love to treat more patients. We want to get more indications and have more diseases. But in fact, that's still relatively limiting in Australia in terms of the funding. So I mention that because it is, as I said, it's an expensive product. It's not something that I think if we keep trying to do it in the way that we're doing it at the moment, that we're realistically going to be able to deliver a car for everyone who could benefit. So I think that's where trials and thinking outside the box are really important. Um, where to next? As I said, we'd love to be able to see there's good evidence that people people really do benefit from CAR in their, their second line of therapy rather than the third line. So again, can we will we get access for these patients earlier in their disease course? What about other types of lymphoma? What if your lymphoma doesn't have CD19? We hope we'll have new products and things that will allow us to treat more patients. Um, you know, these, these 19, 20, 22, there are some very fancy cars in the, in the laboratories out there in the world that can target two antigens at once. Um, so, you know, having these other constructs. And that all comes down to people who are really good at molecular biology and designing new genetic um, constructs. And equally, as I said, there's some very exciting stuff even happening in the non-lymphoma and the non-hematology space. You know, the same way that sort of checkpoint inhibition has become a standard of care in uh, people with melanoma, can we have targets that take these benefits of CAR to other cancer settings? And so, again, really exciting area of research and one that I hope to contribute to. Um, so that's all I was going to present, but certainly very happy to keep the dialogue going and, and hope that's been helpful to you. You're not off the hook just yet, No. <laughs> At the risk of sounding like I'm talking too much. Listen, I'm <laughs> just curious, uh, you, you mentioned early on in the presentation around the states being you know, reasonably well advanced in this particular field. And the, the manufacturing or the supply chain aspect is all out of, um, you know, make Australia... For Australian cars. There are some in Europe, I should say, but right. at the moment in Australia, the pathway is that ours are manufactured in the United States. Is there a future space where there could be public or public-private in regard to bringing that on shore? Yeah. Um, a, obviously, the timeline is then reduced, which... Um, I'm sure there'd be a cohort that would be very happy about a reduced timeline. And then secondly, obviously, it may reduce some of the cost impact aspect as well. Yep. So I, I touched on that before. I really want to highlight this doctor here. She's very unassuming, doesn't like to put herself forward, but she's got a clinical trial that we've been running at the Royal Brisbane where we make them in this building. Um, in our stem cell lab, um, it's a clinical trial. We've got limited capacity. We'd love to be able to treat lots of people on that trial. We've treated 19 of a planned 25 so far. Um, and so, as I said, that means that we can produce a CAR T cell from the time to collection to infusion is 12 days. Um, and as far as I know, we do not charge anyone half a million dollars for that car. Um, anyone who wants to pay us to, to make more, <laughs> we'd love to, because I think I think these are the way these are the types of ways forward that Australia will get expanded access. Um, I think the other really exciting thing that there are lots of trials going on at the moment is that what if we don't need your cells to make a car? What if we can take cells from a fit, healthy person um, and we can make them into a car that anybody else won't reject? So this is this sort of concept of an off-the-shelf car. Um, I, I tend to use the word, you'll notice I say car, I don't say car T. So there is some other clinical trials evaluating what's called a car NK product. So NK cells are another part of the immune system. They're a bit more... Um, primitive in terms of how they work, but equally when we give NK cells from one patient to the next, they're not rejected in the same way some of these more adaptive immune cells are. So that we have a clinical trial at the Royal that uses CAR NK cells. So that means this frozen bag of CAR cells is one that's on the shelf waiting for a patient to turn up who it would be suitable for. Um, there are lots of other programs um, that will try and do that either with NK cells. There's another group called Gamma Delta T cells that you can potentially make CAR from. Um, these things are all in the clinical trial space at the moment. There is no public access, but they are certainly areas that we try and um, have for our patients who, for whatever reason, we can't do CAR. So I think, so. yeah, so on, on local manufacture is really one thing that might really change that game in terms of cost, access and timing. Um, 
off the shelf cars with all of the fancy ways we have to immunologically engineer them is another way that we may be able to do that. And the other thing about off the shelf is there can be an economy of scale. But, but this process is really part of the difficulty. It's a bespoke product, if you like. It's, it's made, it's a therapy made for you from your cells. But to do that involves a lot of time, effort and money. And that's part of the limit, limitation at the moment. Thank you. Oh, one more question, and then we may have to move on just in the interest of time. I know I'll stick very, around if you like. A, it can yeah. come and cost me as long as I get to drink my coffee. It's a very interesting <laughs> topic, and your questions have been great so far, but we might um, keep this as the last one, if that's okay. Um, you alluded to um, uh, different antigens on, on the surface of cells. So the CAR Ts attack uh, CD19. Correct. But, but presumably the, the lymphomas will have their own unique antigens, and maybe they're they are lymphoma specific. So the other direction, and I'm sure you've thought about this, is, is to actually more personalise the, the, the T cells rather than have a, a sort of a generic CAR T cell. Yeah, so the, that, that essentially is, is, again, something that there's lots of active research on. So as I said, if I just get back to this one, um, so, so obviously there are things other than 19. So on, on B cell lymphomas, there's 20, there's 22. So we can make cars to them. Um, there is a field, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to highlight, Josh is going to talk about more personalised cancer antigens. That's actually much harder because every single cancer, and you can see here, why can, why can these lymphomas evade T cells? They get pretty good at hiding some of these markers. Um, and equally, to make a CAR T cell, you have to have really validated that the genetic construct you've made to actually make the thing on the cell works. So it's probably not going to be feasible to make an individual CAR construct for every different patient. But there certainly is potential to maybe make CAR products that have a mix of, of genetic construct, so they might target more than one thing. There are some here that you can see this has got the CD19 targeting bit up the top. There's other ones that have two or even three um, to try and target more than one thing. So yes, that's very much where we're trying to go with CAR to try and improve the numbers of patients who will respond. Um, but probably the concept of producing an individualised CAR T construct as well as product is probably not going to make it more accessible or easier for, to treat patients with. Thank you so much, um, Andrea. Could we all just... Um, I forgot to uh, mention in my welcome that all of our speakers today volunteer their time, so we do really appreciate them coming out on their day off to, um, to, to be with us today. Um, I'd just also like to mention that Lymphoma Australia does a lot of work in the advocacy space. So we um, work with government and other key stakeholders to advocate um, for lymphoma patients in Australia to have better access to treatments such as CAR-T but not CAR-T by itself. So it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker who has flown from Sydney to be with us today um, to present on finding your new normal. Um, so I'd like to introduce Dr. Tony Lindsay, who is a senior clinical psychologist who has been working with both adults and adolescents in the oncology city setting since 2007. Tony works at the Chris O'Brien Lifehouse in the oncology service and is a specialist in the care of adolescents and young, young adults with cancer. Tony teaches in the Department of Adolescent Medicine at the University of Melbourne and the University of Sydney Nursing School. She is the chair in the International Psychosocial Oncology for Adolescent and Young Adult Cancer Care Group and is actively involved in several, several multi-site research projects. She has published three books, The Certainty Myth, which was released in 2022, and like her two other books, Cancer, Sex, Drugs and Death and The Cancer Companion, are about the use of acceptance and commitment therapy, or ACT. She is an ARPA-approved supervisor and provides clinical supervision for both psychologists and other healthcare professionals. Please welcome Dr. Tony Lindsay. Thank you. I'm just going to move that because I'm not nearly as tall as Andrea. Um, so I just want to say first up, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, you mentioned that I come up here on my side. It's a very lovely thing to do. Brisbane is very warm and sunny and unlike Sydney, which is warm and rainy. Um, so um, I, we're going to have a little bit of a change of pace here 
in the sense that um, my job is much more about talking about what's happening in our heads and what happens in our kind of lived experience of this stuff in an emotional, kind of the technical term, I guess, is the psychosocial part of this, right? Um, so I have worked in this space for a long time and one of the things that kind of pretty consistently shows up in all of the patients I see is this real grapple with how do you manage uncertainty and how do you deal with this kind of big thing appearing in your life that you were not expecting? Because as we know, the big things that we are expecting in life don't really tend to take as much by surprise and we kind of know what to do with them. Um, but then the other thing that kind of bumps, that kind of we bump into is what does it mean to live well with stuff? So lots of what I'm going to talk about today is not necessarily about fixing anxiety or getting rid of how we feel about stuff, but much more coming from a perspective of when we bump into hard things, how do we cope with them? What, what's going to help us get through hard stuff as opposed to kind of telling our brains that we don't need to worry about it and to put it over here? Because I don't know whether anyone's tried that, but it doesn't tend to work uber well. Um, if you have worked out how to do it, if you could let me know, because there's about <laughs> like, you know, how, seven billion people trying to work that out. So... Um, I've put a couple of quotes, you'll notice um, through the talk, I've put a couple of quotes and this particular book um, is written by a very articulate woman and what I'm going to describe is going to sound really depressing, but it's actually not, it's a really lovely book. Um, it's a woman who, I think she was originally a writer or a journalist from the UK and has written really kind of beautifully about these ideas of what happens when we bump into life and, and she's someone who has struggled with depression and other things over the years. But she has a really beautiful way of couching that kind of idea of even when we're seeing really hard stuff, how do we show up well? And so hopefully that's what you guys are going to take away out of our conversation today. I'm just keeping an eye on the time because you, as you might have guessed, I have the capacity to talk. <laughs> um, so before we get too into it, I just want you guys to take just a couple of minutes to think about the question of how would you know if you're managing well? And I guess conversely, how do you know if you're not? And I just want you to sit on that for a minute. I'm happy if people want to yell stuff out, I'm happy for that to happen as well. I'm conscious that you're in a group of, you know, 45 of your closest friends that you've just met today. Um, so, you know, you might feel compelled to do that. If you don't, that's fine too. You cry? Yep. Yep. The emotion kind of, you can't contain it, it just kind of spills out. Yep. Just out of curiosity, who feels better after they cry? Yep. Who fights against it for a really long time before you let it happen? <laughs> yep. When you're when you're coping well? Yeah. Yep, just going with the just get through that day. Yep. And then you face it with whatever the next day. Yep, absolutely. Which is kind of one of the I don't you might have skipped the um punchline here, but that is kind of one of the parts of managing living with this stuff, right? Is once we start thinking too far in the future, our brain spins. Whereas if we're thinking, okay, well, you know, it's 11 o'clock, I'm going to go for a walk, I'll go get a coffee, okay, cool, well, the sun's out, I'm going to sit and watch a bird. You know, we can cope with that stuff. By the way, I make a few reference to birds. I'm a bit into birds, but that's by the by. Um, what about for other people? How do you know if you're not coping? Feel flat? Feel flat? Yeah. Flat, yep. Flat, tired... Lack of sleep, sleep goes off, motivation's not so much there, everything feels a bit meh, appetite goes, yep. I find something else to focus on on the Yeah, nice. So, not that that's a good thing. <laughs> the distraction, <laughs> yep, yeah. And it's a double-edged sword, that one, isn't it? Because on the one hand, finding some stuff to distract us is actually how we've evolved as humans, right? That's why we're not still living in caves looking at fires. But the other side of that is if we work too hard to distract ourselves then we get into this cycle of avoidance and then when difficult some stuff comes up, we then run away from it and then kind of the cycle feeds itself a bit and lots of people are nodding. So my guess is everyone's bumped into that once or twice. Yep. You only need to ask a uni student about those kind of processes <laughs> to know how that works. <laughs> um, is there any other ones before we kind of screech on? Everything's an effort. Yep. Yep. It's just that like kind of plodding through stuff. Waiting for people. Yep. Yeah, that's a really lovely way of thinking. I'm just imagining you kind of picking up your feet and the, you know, the stickiness of it. So 
I'm really conscious that in the last three or four years, this idea of resiliency has shown up everywhere, right? COVID was great for getting psychological language just really into the mainstream and then kind of misinterpreting it and, you know, spinning it around in ways that are really unhelpful if you're a psychotherapist. Um, So when I'm kind of thinking about resiliency and if I'm thinking about how when my patients show up to see me, that idea of resiliency is very much around... It's not about not finding stuff difficult or not knowing what to do. But it's often much more about I can recognise that this is really hard and working out, well, we're not always going to be happy and things won't always be good for us. And, in fact, if you look through human history, there's been very few times where things have actually been good for us. We just happen to be in one of the spaces where life for most of us has probably been okay most of the time. And as anyone kind of... um, knows about the natural distribution of things. We have some people in life who never bump into difficult things. I never meet those people, but I'm sure they exist. Um, And then at the other end of that bell curve, we have people who bump into difficult things all the time and life is really, really hard. But most of us probably sit somewhere in the middle, right? We have stages and times in life where hard stuff happens or it doesn't. And so coming from that idea of, well, if we don't put pressure on ourselves to be okay all the time or to be happy all the time, then that actually gives us lots of space to then kind of actually be really curious about, well, what does it mean to be coping? What does it mean to be resilient in the face of hard things? And so this is equally applicable to lymphoma, carers, stuff, as what it is to climate change, coping with life, I'm overwhelmed, work's too hard, you know, all of the pieces. And so... When I'm talking about, you know, I put that little line there at the end, which is a little bit controversial, about bouncing back, it's not necessarily that you bounce back unaffected or that you kind of finish, you know, it's quite interesting. I often have patients turn up in my clinic room and they're genuinely puzzled as to why they don't feel the same at the end of treatment as what they did before they started. And it's kind of like, yeah, but why would you? Like, I can't can't fathom, like, it's much harder for me to fathom that idea than the opposite, right? But we, we kind of put these expectations on ourselves all the time. We see it, you know, I use grief as a really good example. After someone dies, people will say, oh, it's, it's been a couple of months, you should be back, back to normal. It's like, oh, no, you're, you're not going, whatever that was, this is your normal now, right? The grief is part of where you are. In the same way that for everyone in this room, the lymphoma is where you are. And you might not be there forever, but you'll probably carry bits of it forever, right? So, we've talked a little bit about this, right? But how do we clock when our brain's starting to betray us a little bit? Because often what happens is in psychology land, we like to imagine that there's this really linear relationship between how people feel and what shows up. But actually, it's not linear at all. You know, how many of you guys have been coping stupidly well with the big stuff and then someone will drop something on the floor in front of you and you completely lose your shit, right? (laughs) Maybe that's just me. Um, (laughs) That's a function of this stuff. So I often think about it, um, I'm a bit of a mad keen surfer, and so I often think a little bit about being in the surf. When we get on a wave really early, we can tell that there's a bit of pressure on the wave, we can notice it, we're starting to kind of get a bit of momentum. But if we wait until we're at the top of the wave, if I give you a surfing analogy, if you take off on the wave at that point, it's not going to go well. (laughs) I've got 15 stitches in the back of my head to show. Um, And what, what happens at that point is it's really, really difficult for you to course correct. But that's what's happening when we're losing our shit because we've dropped something on the floor. But what always happens is there's about 15 steps before that where we're going, going, you know, that little niggling voice on the side of your brain's going, dude, take, take five minutes, take five minutes, take five minutes. And you're like, shut up, brain. I don't have time for this. I'm, you know, one of the things that I often hear is, but I, sh- I just need to be positive. I just need to be okay. You know, if, if I'm not positive, what does that mean? It's like, it means you're a normal human. Because how, how do we, you know, we often have really high expectations of ourselves around, I've bumped into this really hard thing and I'm just going to be okay with it. But why? And so if we can learn to recognise those little early warning signs on the wave, 
then hopefully it means we don't get to the bit where we're falling over the front of it. Do any of you have any good early warning signs? You get cranky? Yeah. Yep. 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 Yeah, no, 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 I'm with you. Yep. 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 Yep, the cranky irritability, agitation, can't settle, can't sit still. Yep, low tolerance. <coughs> yep, someone mentioned sleep before. Sleep usually is one of the first things that disappear. For me, I find it's things like I stop laughing as much or my, you know, things that I would normally kind of, because as you can tell, I laugh a bit, make a few jokes. I notice that that's any kind of just turn into a bit more bland version of yourself, right? I drink a bit more. Drink a bit more, <laughs> yep, absolutely. Yep, yeah. My guess is most people try that one. Yeah, and it, and it works really well for about five minutes, right? Yeah, not so great the next morning. Yeah, yeah. Go shopping. All of those things that we like to just shut our brains. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. So I wonder what it would be like in the next couple of days, weeks, is if you guys actually clock those things, right? And go, oh, is that an early warning sign that's showing up? You can come up with, you can hold the picture of this head, you can come up with, you know, whatever. But I think sometimes that stuff's really, really helpful to just, because once we've seen it, then we can do something with it, right? So, everyone will have seen this photo. <laughs> this is the um, undergraduate psychology training. <laughs> um, so everyone will have heard of the guy called Maslow, right? He was a guy with the fluffy monkeys and the, like, we all like to be nurtured and human. I don't know why fluffy monkeys is the one thing that stuck in my head from my psychology training, but, you know, it's kept me in good stead. Um, we forget the simple things really quickly. And so some of this is probably a bit biologically driven because... Um, most of the stuff that we do emotionally has actually come from our time as cave people, greater or lesser extent. And so the systems that drive us are these really, really primitive ones. So when we're uncomfortable, we do things to get out of discomfort. And that works really well if you're in a cold cave because you go, huh, what's that red thing? Maybe I could make some fire. Oh, look at that, I'm not cold anymore. Really helpful, right? But when we're emotionally uncomfortable, we do all of those things. I might have a drink, I'll go shopping, I need to distract myself, I can't bear, I'm going to get really agitated. And so what we kind of need to do is think about how, when that stuff shows up, how do we let ourselves, or kind of how do we hack the system a little bit, right? And so my guess is that everyone in this room has had the experience of being on a really good track with something, you've gotten into good habits, you're feeling really good, life's kind of going well, and then something happens. And sometimes it's big stuff, lymphoma, or it might be little things that, you know, the car breaks down and so then you can't get to the gym or you can't do the thing that you like to do or whatever it might be. And really quickly we drop off those things that feel like they're kind of extra bits, right? The stuff where we look after ourselves well, where we sleep well, where we look after our nutrition. But actually if we look at what we're meant to do in life, that's the stuff that kind of keeps us ticking along, right? And I'm going to speak really targetedly, it's not a word, um, to the carers in the audience. Because you guys, you are the, like, if I had to look at a group of patients who, I, I call everyone patients, by the way, I'm not being, you know. Um, if I look at the patients who turn up to see me, most often it's the carers where everything's falling apart and they're at breaking point, who've stopped doing all of the things that are helpful because they're putting all of their energy into caring for someone. Which is a beautiful, lovely, noble thing but I always think about that idea of if you're struggling in the ocean, the least helpful thing you can do is to jump in the ocean, right? Actually, the thing that you need to do is find something to throw the other person. But the nature of being so immersed in looking after someone or being present to someone who's unwell is that everyone tends to end up in the ocean. And so doing these really simple things is actually a really helpful kind of... Um, antidote to some of this stuff and you know if if someone comes into my clinic room seeking you know I'm thinking carers particularly but for any of my patients if they come into my clinic room and say 
oh, I'm really stressed, tell me what to do. And I say, well, what I think you should do is you need to carve out some time for self-care. They're probably going to like get up and walk out, right? Because that's actually not helpful. But I guess I'm thinking about how do we connect a bit more with what's my body telling me? What's my brain telling me? How do I, you know, am I sleeping well? Well, if I'm having 35 cups of coffee in the day, I'm probably not going to sleep well, right? Or actually I've gotten myself completely out of whack because I'm trying to do X, Y and Z over here. Well, what does it look like if I just kind of tweak around the edges and see whether that helps? Um, everyone bangs on about exercise and for a really, really good reason. If we, as humans, if we get up and move, we sort out most of our mental health and most of our physical health and lots of our sleeping problems. Um, we tend to regulate later appetite, all of that stuff. I'm not talking about running marathons. I'm just thinking a nice walk out in the sunshine around the block. You know, stuff that kind of gets you out of the house and gets you moving. So, what do we do with this stuff? So I've already said to you that we're not going to get to the end of today and go, okay, well, we've got a solution for that. Great. Tick. But what can we do? So I've got a few little, cheap, little cute photos which will hopefully be more helpful to hold in your head than the words. Um, but coming from this idea of we need to accept that hard stuff is going to show up. And we're going to talk a little bit about acceptance in a sec because acceptance is a really loaded space. We're going to notice stuff, but we're not going to fight with it. We're going to come back to the here and now. And when it does show up, we're going to name it and we're going to be really present to it. And we're going to do what's important and we're going to be kind to ourselves. How many people are doing that already? Because you can go to lunch early. <laughs> <laughs> Got a 50-50 here? Yeah. Sounds simple, right? As I say to my patients, simple, not easy. Um, so... When I'm talking about acceptance, I'm not talking about the acceptance that we hear about, which is the, I just need to be okay with whatever happens. Because we're never gonna be okay with some of the stuff that happens to us, right? I was chatting with a patient earlier in the week and he is in a pretty terrible situation and he's really sad and he's just like, but I just need to accept this. I'm like, oh, I don't think you're ever gonna accept this and that's okay. But what I'm thinking about when we're talking about acceptance is we're going to accept the stuff around it. So I really like this picture just because it's way more articulate than what I am. So it's raining. I don't like the rain. I wish it wasn't raining. My day would be better if it wasn't raining. My day is ruined. Every day is like this. It's always like this. Why does it always rain when I want to do something? How many of you have that thought or versions of those thoughts? This might, is equally applicable, by the way, to rain as it is to chemo side effects, knee pain, in my case, hip pain. Um, this is a bit of human nature stuff, right? We're always kind of framed stuff around the impact on us. But actually, if we're talking about this idea of acceptance, and by acceptance I'm kind of meaning we just kind of show up and be open to whatever happens. It's raining. Has anything changed in that picture? It's still raining. <laughs> yep. Yep. But my guess is if you're the person who wakes up and goes, oh, it's raining, okay. That's going to look really, really different than what you're carrying in your brain. So I like the little dinosaurs because I think they're cute. Not real life, like I saw that big giant thing out there. I'm like, oh my God, what the hell's going on here? <laughs> I saw these people in Jurassic Park outfits. Um, so when we're talking about acceptance, we're talking about, ah, oh, I see you. I'm going to let you be here. And I'm going to accommodate the space that this hard thing might take. You'll notice that nowhere does it say, I'm going to keep you at arm's length and work really hard to not let you be here. because that's when we get caught up in this stuff. Do you guys remember doing tug of war at school? Yeah. yeah. I don't know whether it's still a thing. I don't know. Kids, kids probably don't talk about tug of war anymore. Um, but, you know, that idea of we assume that the only way we win tug of war is by pulling really hard. The way that we can win the tug of war is by dropping the rope, right? 
The other team falls on their bums. I wish I'd have thought of that when I was a kid. I'm small. Like, tug of war is not the natural kind of sport for me. Um, but we're doing this with our thoughts all the time. That rain example is a really good one, right? There's the rain and then there's the thinking about the rain. And that's where the struggle is. So we've probably got some stuff in here about uncertainty and other worries that might show up that we're in this constant fight with. So in the same way we did with the rain, if we kind of go, ah, oh, uncertainty, I see you, there you are, I can either kind of stay in this struggle or you can just be there and I'll be here. But we're not having to pull against each other all the time. We talked about it before. How do we come back to the here and now? Uncertainty, worry, what happens in the future, that's all over there. And do you know what? I don't, I don't know about you guys, but my, I'm willing to bet that if I had have met anyone here six months before your diagnosis, you would have said to me, oh, my God, there's no way I would ever cope with that. Right? Yeah. That's the stuff that happens to other people. That will never happen to me. I'd never cope. God. But yet here you all are. Coping with that. And my guess is that whatever life has in store for you next, you would assume that you won't cope with that either. But you probably will. And experience tells us we do, right? Yep. And we don't think about it, to be honest. So the question, in case anyone missed it, was is that because we undervalue our resilience? We always... We're evolutionarily wired to assume the worst because that's what's kept us alive, right? Because the person that uh, where the tiger shows up when we're cave people and we go, oh, pretty cat, look at your nice colours. <laughs> that person's not here to talk to us. <laughs> so we are, we're kind of evolutionarily wired that we will be risk averse and we'll be constantly worried about the next thing. And so there is a bit of dual processing stuff that goes on there in the context of we don't let ourselves, but we also, we, there is kind of a bias for us around we underestimate how hard the future will be or we overestimate how hard it's going to be and we underestimate how well we'll, how well we'll cope. And so we do get this kind of funny thing. But do you know what we're all doing in the moment? We're okay, right? And even if this moment doesn't feel okay, anyone can get through a difficult moment, right? And so then maybe the next moment does feel okay. But I'm pretty sure that even if this moment does, doesn't feel great, because let's, let's be honest, there are some stuff that doesn't feel okay. But even if we're connected in that moment, we might connect with something else. We might be able to hear, oh, what's that random sound that's just over there? Or we might be able to notice, oh, my breathing's a bit faster than normal. Or, you know, the dog or the kids or whoever playing in the backyard. So even if we're maybe not necessarily okay in that moment, whatever that means, we can still connect with something else and we can be present to that thing. And what we know, and there's really good research around this, is that being present and connecting with that stuff actually protects us a bit from lots of the other kind of complex mental health stuff. And you see this, you know, kids are a really good example, right? Kids are constantly in the present. You know, because time, they don't understand time the way we do, right? So they're like, oh, it's like school holidays go forever and I've got so much stuff to do. And we're like, oh, my God, those two weeks have gone so, so fast. I haven't even scratched myself yet, you know. So there is something about, and actually what we find, and there's good kind of evidence around this, that being present actually does slow things down. It allows us more space. And probably up until our very recent past, our lives were much, much slower. And we don't allow ourselves space anymore. Um, I was chatting with someone the other day. I'm just conscious of time because, you know. Um, I was chatting with someone the other day and they had made a really astute observation that if you look at other animals in the wild, most of their time is actually spent resting. <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> You're not seeing birds frantically running around all the time. They'll run around for a bit and then they'll just sit under a tree for a bit. Um, we talked a little bit about giving things a name. But how powerful is it when you can kind of see something and you give it an identity? This works really, really well with things like anxiety and depression. Often people will come into my clinic room 
and they'll come in thinking they're going mad and they'll be describing all of these things. And I might just say to them, hmm, sounds like anxiety showed up. And they're like, oh, is that what this is? I'm like, yeah. They're like, oh, oh, well, I can do stuff with anxiety, can't I? Yep. And all of a sudden that thing that was kind of hovering over them and this kind of panic and worry that they're about to unravel is actually just this thing that they can go, oh, okay, anxiety, cool. All right, well, what am I going to do about that then? We talk a lot about this in things like scanxiety. Oh, you know, that anticipatory anxiety about chemo. Something really powerful about naming that. As a little aside, what people find really helpful is actually giving those things different names. So when that anxiety about chemo shows up, you know that feeling you get when you're about to walk through the hospital door? Calling that something else, not nausea, not I feel sick, you know, some, some of my patients randomly will call it names, like Fred. Um, be as creative as you wish. But actually, how much more powerful it is, oh, yeah, when I go to chemo, Fred comes with me. Okay, cool. Because then it's not, oh, I've got this nausea and, I'm, you know, like just that kind of piece around how you connect with it feels really different. The thing itself is the same. And this is one of those things where it's easy to say and harder to do. We all know when we're doing stuff that's important to us, we feel better. Sometimes this stuff is really hard to connect with when we're unwell. And that's the stuff that, you know, when we were talking about the Maslow stuff, that's sometimes the stuff that disappears really quickly. But what we know is that if you're turning up and doing the stuff that feels important, actually everything else feels easier too. And so when, you know, in psychology land, we're not often talking about what's the specific goal that you're going to do. But actually, what I'm thinking about is, what direction do we want to be heading in? Because actually, your goal might be to, I'm going to use a sport analogy because they're convenient. Um, the goal might be to run a marathon, right? But that might not be the value piece. The value piece might be I actually just like being connected to my body. And so even if you're not feeling well, you can be connected to your body in a million different ways, right? And maybe that's as simple as I'm going to get up and get dressed and go and sit in the sunshine for five minutes because maybe that's five minutes more than what I did the day before and I'm actually going to feel awesome for doing that. And if the day after that you sit for 10 minutes or you go and have a coffee with a friend, awesome. But maybe it's just that five minutes and that's okay. But thinking about what are these little ways that I can connect with, with myself, with my body, with the stuff that's important to me. You know, people – and, you know, my guess is that all of you guys have bumped into this – when we find hard things, we, the value stuff gets really easy for us, right? If I talk to my um, clinician colleagues who don't work in oncology or haematology, they talk to me about, oh, it's so hard to do values work with people. People don't know what's important. I'm like, oh, come and talk to my patients. They, you know, the second you're diagnosed, everything comes into focus, right? And most of the time, it's people, relationships, your body, health, right? Maybe there's a few others around that. Do you know what no one's saying to me? Geez, work's really important. The function of work is often important in the sense of it gives me structure, I like to be, you know, connected with other people, but it's rarely the work itself. It's really interesting. But actually, you guys have got really good evidence of, well, what, what was the stuff that showed up for me in that? Because if that's relationships, but you've noticed that since treatment's been happening, you've completely disconnected from everyone, then there's probably something in that, right? And my guess is, if those relationships feel important, then you connecting in any way is probably going to feel better than what it does to not connect. Even if that, you know, even if right now you don't have the energy to look after the grandkids or be, you know, going out for long lunches or, you know, whatever people do. We're nearly there, I promise. Um, I think this is the thing that we're really good at doing for other people. My guess is, you know, for you people that are sitting next to each other, my guess is if you heard, if those other people heard the dialogue that happens in your brain, they would say to you, oh my God, that's so unreasonable, right? How come you're beating yourself up like this? You're an awesome human. And you would say the same thing to them. There is no way we would talk to a friend the way that we talk to ourselves. And so there's something really powerful, particularly in the face of this really hard stuff, you know, because right now, and for most of us, right, 
the guy on this shoulder is this like loud, booming, irritating, you know, particularly if there's a bit of anxiety or depression stuff kind of tied up in that. This guy gets really loud. But there is absolutely this other guy on your shoulder going, dude, you're doing the best you can. This is really hard. You're showing up well. So kind of my challenge to you a little bit is, how do we listen to that guy? And maybe he's never as loud as this guy, and that's okay. But how do we kind of notice that guy and just kind of dial in on him a little bit? Um, I don't know whether anyone's read this book. It was kicking around a few years ago. I think she's just recently wrote, written a new one about grace, which I suspect would also be really interesting for everyone in this room to read. Um, but that idea of awesome stuff is all around us. And even when things are hard, we can still connect with those things and it will still make us feel good. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Julia Baird um, has had a lot of kind of, I'm not sure exactly what, but some oncology staff has had lots of big surgeries, lots of time in hospital. So m many of my patients have really kind of resonated with this stuff because it's like, oh, I see myself in that. But she's also a mad keen ocean swimmer. And so she talks a lot about what, what are the things that we see under the ocean, but also that process of getting up early in the morning when it's dark and throwing yourself into cold water and all of that kind of stuff. You know, I suspect your water here isn't particularly cold. We're not Sydney Harbour cold. Um, but, you know, thinking about some of those things. Um, and I guess kind of on that same vein, those questions of how do I check in with myself? How do I know that I'm doing okay? And my guess is for most of us, we don't, we don't need to ask that many questions before we know the answer to that, right? It's usually not hidden that far down that we need to go kind of burrowing through all of this like deep-seated trauma or whatever. It's just like they're telling us, I don't feel okay. Things, things are feeling hard right now. What's going on for me? So who can you talk to? Like we said, naming this is actually the best first step. Unless somebody can identify this for yourself, no one in your world will know about it necessarily. The exception to that is sometimes the people who are really close to you will say, God, you're irritable. You're driving me nuts. How come you're awake at three o'clock in the morning every night? Or I've noticed when you're talking to me, you're not, you know, we're not talking about the future anymore. We're just stuck in the past or we're getting really caught up in things that don't feel helpful. Now, maybe sometimes people will say that. My guess is if you're unwell, people are going to be pretty reluctant to say that stuff to you. Just a guess. So... If, unless you recognise it, it might be a bit hard for other people to recognise it. But when you do, it's really helpful to talk to other people about it. So an exercise I sometimes get my patients to do is to trace a little outline of your hand and then in each finger, write the name of someone you can talk to. Now, one of those people might be the dog, to be fair, right? Dogs are great. Take all of the stuff and just want to go for a walk. But there's probably some other people in there that you can kind of share this stuff with. And it maybe doesn't need to be big, kind of a big share. It can just be, oh, geez, this feels hard at the moment. Talking to your team is a really good resource. Number one, most of the time they'll say, oh, my God, this happens to all of our patients. Sorry, we didn't realise this was happening to you. Um, which kind of has a dual focus. One is that they know that maybe things are a bit harder than what they thought they were for you. But the other one is... I'm not the only person on the island, right? None of us want to be the only person on the island. Um, if you've got a good GP, have a chat with them. You know, I know that sometimes people are a bit nervous to talk to their haematology team about this stuff because, you know, we've all got kind of versions of stuff going on in our mind. Or, oh, God, if I tell them, then what if they think I'm not coping and then they might not give me that next treatment? Or, you know, think about the cut. Well, what if they don't think I'm eligible because maybe I, they feel like I'm not coping as well as I could be? Um, most of that's not true, by the way, just FYI. Um, that's in here for us. But, you know, if you don't want to talk to the team, there are lots of other people you can chat with. Um, and then the other thing is, how do we recognise when some of the communication we're having is helpful or unhelpful? So some of that's between your team and you. It might be between you and your close people. But there might be just some stuff that's happening in your world that you're actually finding is really unhelpful. So, you know, that friend who keeps showing up and saying, well, I had the, you know, my friend's friend's friend um, had cancer and they used to eat, like, just olive pips all day. And, I don't know, I haven't actually heard that one, but it's unrealistic enough. Um, and so then every time you speak to them, you're like, oh, my God, I can't do this anymore, right? There's probably some... 
Well, there's a couple of simple ex ways of getting around that. One is you just stop talking to that person. <laughs> but if you want to maintain a friendship, maybe there's a conversation to be had here, there that will actually, you know, short, short term hard, long term easy. Um, and just to finish up, everything's just for now. So even when stuff is feeling really hard and really difficult, it won't last forever. And everyone in that room knows this explicitly, right? And, but when we're in it, it can be really, really hard to remind ourselves of that. Are there questions, thoughts, feelings? I'm cognizant of lunch. I don't want to be standing between you guys and food. God knows I never want to be stood in between me and food. Um, I can ask you this after if you'd prefer to release people, but um, I have uh, come through stage four diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, primary lymphoma bone last year. Um, and I have two teenagers, 15 and 17. And we were chatting last night and they said, mum, everyone just expects us to be fine because you're back at work and it's all hunky-dory. And they're like, but we're not the same. Mm -hmm. So how do you help? How do I help them? I mean, my daughter, we've already worked out she's had anxiety as a result of last year. So she's seeing a psychologist, but... My son is like, no, I'm fine, but he's not fine. Yeah. So how do we help him? Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Um, I think actually the really powerful thing is, one of the really powerful things in that is actually naming it. No, we're not the same. And we need to now work out what it means to not be the same. But I think one of the things that massively shows up for particularly young people is because they're so dialed in in their peers, they notice that, oh, the way that I think about the world is really different to the way that other people think. I remember meeting a young person years and years ago and she just completely lost it at school. And the reason was she'd gone to school and one of her friends was like banging on that her mum had bought her the wrong jumper. And she'd like, this the friend was like, oh my God, mum's so unreasonable. I hate mum so much. She bought me this shitty jumper, blah, blah, blah. And then my patient was going, dude, my mum's really sick. Like I'm not in the same place, right? Um, but young people often don't have the language to then have that conversation with their friends because of the peer stuff. Mm. So um, I would say that, you know, having space to talk about it, you guys as a family naming it and talking about it. I ha um, had a family once that had teenagers and they, would, they actually had a little elephant that they put in the room. And so when the difficult stuff come up, they would be like, all right, the elephant's at the table with us today. And that was their way of kind of communicating about the tricky stuff. Um, I think linking the kids up with someone external is good. The other resource I would um, mention is Canteen. And so if you can get the young people to Canteen, getting them there is really hard. Once they're there, they get completely suckered and have a great time. Um, but the really nice thing about that is it replicates that I'm not alone on the island thing because they're then surrounded by other young people who've bumped into this stuff. And even if they never talk about it, it's like, oh, I know that your mum had some stuff too. Okay, cool. And so what often happens is if their peer group at school is not being great, that can be a really helpful space and they often foster really, really lovely relationships in that. Does that kind of answer your question? Uh, so Canteen is the organisation for young people living with cancer. So they look after both patients and patient siblings, but also for people whose mums and dads have had cancer. So they look after everyone 12 to 25 um, and there are, um, they've got branches pretty much all around Australia and they do lots of telehealth. They do lots of like random, they used to have a really big focus on like doing camps and stuff. They tend to do less of that now, but they'll have like social events where they'll take them all bowling for the afternoon and they all get to kind of get to know you and, um, do like, they do things like having online gaming meetups and things. So, you know, like I said, it's hard to get young people there cause like, I don't want to do that. But then once they get there, they actually have a cracking time. And then you can't get them out of it. And then they have the opposite end problem at 25 when we're like, okay, guys, you need to kind of <laughs> go into the world now. And they're like, oh, but, you know, all of our social groups here. Um, they also split them between over 18s and under 18s. So the over 18s will often do quite different stuff than the younger guys. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for the talk. No um, I was wondering if you had any specific ideas or tips around survivor's guilt. Because I know in my personal situation that's been really bad and yeah. I don't know after finishing chemo it was almost worse than going through chemo yeah in my yeah, yeah totally um 
I think there's two separate pieces in there and tell me if I'm wrong. Um, the survivor stuff is really, really tricky, right? Because, and it's always, I'm trying to think of the right word. Um, I always find myself oscillating between, it's really helpful for us to get to know other people so you're not on the island by yourself. But then we don't know any... So when we meet people, we don't know who's going to go well and who's not, right? And so it's something we bump into in our adolescent young adult service all the time where people make really lovely friendships and then some people do well and some people don't. And I think the thing in that is actually allowing your spa yourself the space to kind of not only grieve what's happened to you because I think one of the comparison pieces is, well, if I'm doing okay, then I don't have the space here to process my own stuff. Whereas actually allowing yourself the space for that is really important, but also allowing yourself the space to grieve the other person and whatever's gone on in that space. Um, I also think if people are struggling to navigate that by themselves, going and talking to someone can be really helpful because the I've taken the picture away, but the person is really good, the external person is often really good at giving language to that part of our brain that goes, dude, this is really hard and it's okay that you're struggling with it because it's hard for us to find that for ourselves. Um, the other side of that picture is the, for most people psychologically, finishing treatment is way harder than being on treatment. And my, lots of people are kind of nodding along, right? Because when you're on treatment, you're just doing treatment. And treatment's shitty, right? But you're just doing treatment. You don't have to think about doing treatment. Whereas when you finish treatment, you then have to process everything that's happened but then your brain's also thinking about, well, what happens if I have to do that again? And so you don't have the kind of clean psychologicalness that happens when you're on treatment. You know, you've got a regime. Yep, I'm going to the <coughs> hospital this day. Yep, I'm go I know I'm going to feel like this. So it is, it, psychologically, it's way harder. Any final questions? Yeah. Cool. Um, I need to run away to the airport, but if anyone wants to find me, um, I'm happy for people to shoot me an email. And if you've got questions about what do I do, who do I get hooked up with, what are good resources, just give me a shout and I'll try and be helpful. Thank you so much, Tony. I think I could listen to you speak forever. So I'm glad you like talking. My jokes wear out. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so we're going to break for lunch now. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, Tony was talking about the five people that you can talk to. And I just want to let you know that Lymphoma Australian nurses can be one of those people. So we have a nurse support line. You can call us Monday to Friday. It's a 1800 number. Um, and we also have opportunities for connection on our online group chats. And we also hold in-person group chats. And there, another reason why we held today as an in-person seminar is also not just for education purposes, but an opportunity for you to connect with other people who are going through a similar experience with, to you. Um, so during the lunch break, please talk amongst each other, come and speak to myself and Erica. If you have any questions about our services, um, please um, yeah, come and approach us and have a chat. So as I mentioned, the lunch will be held in the River Decks area. So we need to go down the elevator that we came up um, and then turn to your left-hand side um, and um, lunch will be for one hour. So if we can come back at about 1 p.m., that would be great. Thank you.
my way up. Hey everyone, we might get started. I hope you all enjoyed um, your lunch. Um, so this afternoon we're having our third speaker, Josh Tobin, who's going to present on working towards a lymphoma vaccination. So Dr. Josh Tobin is a haematologist and translational scientist with a special interest in indolent lymphoma. After completion of his PhD through the University of Queensland, he moved to the MD Anderson Cancer Centre to complete a fellowship in indolent lymphoma and was awarded both the American Society of Clinical Oncology Young Investigator Award and the American Society of Haematology Global Scholar Award for his research efforts to develop novel immunotherapeutics in follicular lymphoma. He's returned to Australia and works as a lymphoma specialist at the Princess Alexandra Hospital and leads the indolent lymphoma stream in the blood cancer research group at UQ Mater Research. Please welcome Dr. Josh Tobin. All right. Um, thank you, Emma. That was a lovely introduction. And um, thank you to Andrea. It was a fantastic talk in the morning. And uh, really set up sort of a, a great platform to be able to talk about some of these more future focused ideas that we'll discuss today. Um, and thank you for all of you guys. I've been really blown away by the enthusiasm today and how astute and incisive some of the questions have been. I think you've touched on a lot of what I want to get to today. So um, I, promised, uh, I promised when I got here to Erica that I wouldn't get too into the weeds about the immunology, but I am I'm a um, 
very much a nerd. I'm really enthusiastic about this stuff. You all seem like you've got a great base knowledge. If you're really over this stuff and it's, it's, it's all inherent to what you know, um, then consider this a bit of a revision. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yes, just a brief introduction, but uh, I am a clinician scientist. I'm still 80% uh, in, the, in the clinics and 60% in the lab somehow. Um, so I have a, a research lab that's running out of the translational research unit. <laughs> if you've never been there before and you're a PA patient, wonderful place, go get a coffee. Um, I'm transient at the Green Slopes Hospital and I work for UQ. Um, and my interest is in lymphoma generally. I, I have a follicular lymphoma passion because I think it's a weird disease that's strange we can't cure. Um, but my, my goal ultimately in the sort of 10, 20 years um, is to be able to develop and, and bring to Australia these kind of precision immunotherapy ideas um, that Andrew has sort of touched on and, and bringing that more into um, an accessible space. So. Um, I didn't know what to talk about. This is kind of an experimental space for, for all intents and purposes. So I sat down with one of my patients the other day. And I just said to them, what do you want to know about cancer vaccines? And they just spat some questions at me. I think that's probably the questions I'm most likely to get from a lot of you. So I'll just try and address them. Inherently, we're going to have to talk about some immunology. So after a long lunch, waiting to get out and enjoy some sunshine, I'm sure you're happy for an immunology lecture. Um, but what's a vaccine? How does that, how, what am I talking about this for? Um, how do we vaccinate against cancers and why is that important? Um, are they available now and when can I get it here? So um, what is a vaccine? Um, so just to clarify at the outset so there's no confusion, I'm not talking about vaccinations for infectious diseases. As a lymphoma patient, I'm sure all of you have had talks about COVID vaccines and things. Um, COVID's been a fantastic for my field of research because all of a sudden everyone knows the basics of what we're talking about when we talk about RNA vaccines and things. What I'm talking about is a therapeutic vaccine against cancer. Um, so there's been this pervasive idea since the 1970s when we realised that you can actually get an immune response against a cancer cell and that we get it naturally all the time. It's just we can't make them strong enough or robust enough or reliable enough to actually fight cancer. And the question has never been whether we could do it in mouse models and things. It's why it's not working well enough. Um, and so um, to understand that, unfortunately, I'm just going to, have to take you through a little bit of basic immunology and then we can move forward. Um, so vaccines. Fortunately, we've gotten to a point where we understand them very well. Um, but their origins are actually pretty gritty. Um, so in the 1700s, um, particularly in Britain and other really populated Western countries, Smallpox was rampant. Smallpox was an awful disease. Um, it was responsible for about 2% of all deaths. 30% of people that got it would die. The remainder would be left with awful scarring, respiratory problems, and cephalitis. It was a huge problem. And um, Dr. Edward Jenner trained in London, acknowledging that the city was getting pretty unmanageable. Um, after he finished his postdoctorate studies in a big prestigious university, he moved out to a little hamlet about 300 k's out of town. Uh, and there in that small little town, he noticed that the people were getting smallpox much less regularly and that the people that did weren't dying. Um, and, you know, the, the extent of his scientific rigour was that he wrote a letter to one of his mates that still lived in London and he described what he was seeing. Um, I think Andrew and I are both desperately wish this is how medical ethics and publications still worked, where you just think something, write it to your mate and become famous. Um, but essentially what he noticed was that um, the, the, the common folk um, were, were getting this disease in a much less significant way. And as he sort of started studying that in a semi-systematic way, he noticed that the ones that were least likely to be affected were farmhands, milkmaids. Um, and he started speaking to them and he, he started getting really interested in this disease that the fairies called the grease, which was this ulcerating disease that horses and cows would get around their, their heels, around their, their hoofs, rather. Um, and when people touch that, when they touch the, uh, the matter, um, it seemed to generate a disease in humans that looked a lot like smallpox, but wasn't as severe. So they would get these like rashes all down their hands, sometimes it spread to their face and arms. Um, he called that uh, vicina, uh, which means cow in Latin. And in seeing that people were getting this weird smallpox-like disease and recognising that fewer people out there were getting smallpox and dying from it, um, that was the, the sum of data that he needed to then move this into an immediate prospective clinical trial on an eight-year-old boy named James Phipps. Um, and so this is a, uh, I imagine, horrifying rendering of 
what was an inoculation. And at the time, that was where he got a milkmaid's hand with smallpox, and he scraped it onto a needle, and then he injected it into the boy's arm. And that boy promptly and expectedly developed uh, what we now call cowpox. Um, and that was step one of his horrifying experiment. Step two was that he wait, waited for those cowpox uh, marks to resolve. And then six weeks later, he went and got smallpox, and he inoculated that into the boy. And fortunately, as you've all figured, based on the fact that we use vaccines now very regularly, um, he didn't develop smallpox, and in fact, did very well. Uh, and just to check it wasn't a fluke, he repeated that 22 more times. Um, and all of them didn't die of smallpox, at which point he finally sent another letter to his mate in London, um, and now he's immortalised in history. So um, from, from gritty and understandably objectionable beginnings, that is what a vaccine is. A vaccine is essentially where you give an attenuated or a small version of something to build up an education in your immune system to fight the bigger, worse version in the future. Um, all right, so what's actually happening then? So that small version is anything that's non-self. Your body's got this fantastic, uh, and if you ever want to have a separate talk, um, really complicated way of identifying what you look like on a molecular level, every single part of you. Um, from a very early age, you become what, what we call tolerant of self, um, which is a <laughs> probably speaks to how immunologists think. It's very, we're very uh, morbid, pessimistic people, but we tolerate self very well. We don't like self. Um, and so anything that's not self, anything that your body wasn't trained on to see and accept is called not self. And anything that's not self, we call an antigen. Anti meaning not and gen meaning self. Okay? So the, the easiest model to understand is bacteria or viruses. They're all not self. None of them exist naturally as part of your body that you're trained on. So every little protein on the surface of a bacteria is an, is an antigen that your immune system could recognise and should, should recognise. And in the briefest possible terms, we have these things called antigen presenting cells. They walk around looking for antigen and then they just hold them out. And that's all they do in the, in the immune system. But they are the educators. They tell the body what is or is not a problem. And from there, your more effective or your effector immune cells, which are the T cells, which is what Andrew was speaking with today, um, uh, which are um, cytotoxic, they kill cells. Or a B cell, which are the ones that present that make antibodies that you generate when you say have a vaccine. That's how these know what the protein structure they're meant to be, developing antibodies or cytotoxic reactions against get directed, right? That's why we don't have, in most people, your own immune system fighting your own organs and actually just focusing on other things. Obviously, there's examples where that goes wrong, right? So this is the premise, um, is that if you can take that antigen in a weak version or an attenuated version, and then you show it to your antigen cells, that shows it to the cells that then have some effective function and they can remove it every time they see it. And that's a vaccine. Is that clear? Is that, am I crazy? That was pretty good, right? Oh, good. Yeah. Um, so, so cancers then. Um, so, there is no reason that we can't do that with a cancer. Before we get into that, that's an elephant, and that's a mouse, and this is my friend Kotaro. Me and Kotaro shared an office, um, two floors underground at the MD Anderson, which is a cancer centre in the US. Kotaro is an excellent scientist, wonderful researcher. He doesn't speak a word of English. I have no idea. I know nothing about him, but I got this photo on the last day. I really like it. Um, does anyone know? So elephants are about a thousand times bigger than us. They live about the same time as we do, and their cells are the same size. All of us have the same size cells. And cancer occurs largely through cell division. So when, when your cells divide, you get mutations, most likely. Very big, many cells. Mice, same deal, but the other way around. They're about a thousand times smaller than us. Not many cells, they don't live for very long. Um, does anyone know confidently which of those animals, me, no, Kataro, the mouse, or the elephant, gets cancer at the highest rate? Take a stab. Human? Human? No, mouse, 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 for sure. Mouse all the time. Mouse can get cancer all the time. We don't see mouse cancer very often because very few mouse oncologists, but also they get eaten and stuff. <laughs> But it, that's actually the wrong way. It should be the other, right? Like, we all knew kind of on some level, like, mice get cancer. We give mice cancer in the labs all the time. 
But mice are the smallest, they have the fewest cells, their cells divide the least times over their lifetime. And elephants are big, and their cells divide just as regularly as ours do, and they have thousands of times more cells. So why aren't elephants getting more cancers than humans? And why aren't humans getting more cancers than mice? And that was called Pedo's Paradox. That was defined in uh, the 1970s, and it's taken us a long time to really get to the bottom of why. And it's a very complicated answer, but in part, some of it is that we have mechanisms constantly running in our body to pick up mutations, things that cause cancer, and to get rid of them. So that happens both inside the cell. We have mechanisms that uh, detect mutations, and if it's not something that's going to be viable or, or, or favourable, they just turn the cell off. Um, and we have external ways of tracking uh, these cells. And that, that external mechanism is called immunosurveillance, and it is your immune system recognising something is not self and getting rid of it. So in a very real and non-philosophical way, Tony would have said this and it would have sounded much nicer, you are not your cancer cells and your cancer cells are not you. Um, that, is not a, that is not meant to be an inspirational speech. Your body sees cancer cells and says, that's not me, because something's changed. So when your DNA is normal, your DNA is a code, um, and that code is read out and gets printed into a protein, and that protein should look like it's meant to. And if you have cancer, you have a mutation somewhere, and that protein gets printed wrong, and that protein is both what may drive the cancer to behave incorrectly, but it's also a marker that the body can find. And so we call those neoantigens. So antigen still means not self, and neo means new, like neo. Nazi, I guess. <laughs> um, so, same diagram, exact same diagram, and the only thing I've changed is that it's not a bacteria, now it's a cancer cell. So your cancer cells make neoantigens, neoantigens get presented to your antigen-presenting cells, and then you find them. Right? So, that's great, but then we had a really clever, this guy, really clever, in the audience, said, but why are we not just finding those mutations and making CAR-Ts against them, that'd be awesome. And that's a brilliant idea, and I've got about 15 slides to explain why that's what we want to do. <laughs> um, do you want a job? <laughs> so the problem with that approach is that it costs a quarter million to $500,000 to give someone a CAR T cell against an antigen that we know everything about. We know everything about CD20. We know where it is. We know where it isn't. We know what it looks like. We know how to target it. So even if you're not doing any of the science in the lead up to make an antibody against that, uh, just to make the product is very, very expensive, let alone how long it took us the 20 or so years to be able to make a car, a receptor that could target it. And the issue is that every single cancer has got several mutations. They are variably immunogenic, so some of them will definitely target an immune cell, some of them won't target it at all. Um, and they're all different, so any one of you, even with the same disease, may have different mutations leading to your cancer, as you all know. Um, and so to do this in a personalised way is really complicated and we haven't had the tools to do it and they're slowly, slowly, slowly starting to come available to us. But this would be the perfect, perfect idea for a personalised vaccine, how we would run it. So what you would need to do is you would need to take a biopsy and you need to get their tumour cells and then you would sequence them. Sequencing up until about 10 years ago was exceedingly expensive. You know, you just couldn't have done it in lots of people. But that has become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper to the point that now we can sequence someone for a few hundred dollars. And the next step is to put that through a very complicated set of algorithms that not just tell you what the mutant gene is, but also how likely it is to aggravate the immune system. Because they're not all going to be aggravating the immune system. Some of them just look pretty similar to normal. And that computing power has been very hard to come by until very recently. So in the last five years, we've seen an expansion in how much we're able to know about those mutations and the proteins, and that's largely been driven by AI. But once you know that, there's then a whole bunch of ways that you can make a vaccine. COVID had some very unexpected positive outcomes in that we can now make vaccines very quickly um, because we put a lot of money and infrastructure into figuring out how to make a new vaccine. And so there are a number of ways that you could then make a vaccine against whatever you were sequencing and finding is important. And then it's just a normal immune system. And then you just present it to your antigen presenting cell and you give it to your tumour killing cells and it kills tumour. And so that's, that's the general premise about how we can make a personalised vaccine. This is just a brief 
sort of overview of, of some of the vaccine strategies we've got. These are really exciting. They've changed the landscape. This peptide vaccine, that was the old one. That's how you get your uh, diphtheria and tetanus and things. Like we just take a piece of the protein, we heat shock it, and then we give it to you and it won't affect you because it's broken. But these newer ones, um, RNA vaccines, um, which are where we actually give you the code and then we make your body print it, um, which, you know, that, that raised a lot of eyebrows when we started doing it for COVID. We'd never made an RNA vaccine before. People were worried that the RNA would cause problems. But then, by and large, I think the accepted uh, literature would say that it didn't cause the problems we had some concerns about. Antigen-presenting vaccines. So you could actually just skip all those steps, get your antigen-presenting cells, load them up with the thing you want them to train your antibody, your immune system to focus on, and then just give them back. The problem with that is that's, that's been done and you have to actually give it into the tumour. So it's like an intratumoral. So it may be trickier in lymphoma, but doable. And then the other one, which really touches on everything that Andrew spoke about, is in the future, this technology to make CAR Ts is also going to get cheaper. And we're going to get better at it. It doesn't have to be a CAR T, but there are other cellular therapies you could make. And so you could skip even the antigen presenting step Outside the body, you could just insert a bunch of genes in that you want it to express to chase that antigen and give it back to the patient. And that's, those are sort of the directions you could take it. How'd it go? Is that, yeah. we're all there? Yeah. We're all there, okay. Yes, yeah, go ahead. Um, oh, sorry, <laughs> don't, go ahead. I'm just curious, so, your DNA profile or a, a failure within that to some degree potentially leads to the, the, the mutation of a, of a cell uh, and cancer. You, you talk about the, the DNA profiling aspect. So is that the identification of that original fault within your DNA sequencing to then try and basically map to fix that? Is that what that is? Uh, no, we don't want to fix it, I and mean, we'd love to fix it. Um, I don't know how to fix it. So you sequence the tumour. We do this now all the time. You know, you know, sorry to bring up something you said before, but you, you know that you've got a TP53 immune, for instance, right? We know that because we sequenced it. So that sequencing process is just reading the code. Um, so we can do that now. That, that mutation is what drives it to become a cancer. You know, a cancer is whenever a cell stops... Listening to all the things around it, it starts making too many copies of itself. It starts going places it shouldn't do. That's that's coded in the DNA. And if the DNA is coding wrong, if something's changed in it, then that's why that happens. The process from there is not to fix the DNA, but to know what the mutant is, right? Like if you know what it looks like, then you can make an antibody against it. Yeah, I guess that's yeah. my argument, root cause. So the, yeah. the root cause is what you're identifying. Is there a, I appreciate that the vaccine is what potentially addresses that. I guess I was even trying to even peel back one more layer, mm. which was at your DNA level, is there space? Yeah. Or is there a future in at that level? It, and maybe that's something, it's a bridge too far. I don't want well, to take us down a rabbit hole, I'm sorry. Well, no, 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 it's, it's, it's actually the right. So there's this problem with that um, Dr. Hendon sort of touched on, let's just talk about CAR T's for a second, like where your CD19 or CD20 targeting cells, right? There are cells that will lose those, those antigens that we're targeting, you know, um, and we see that in lymphomas that relapse after a CAR T, they lose their CD19. Um, so not all cancer cells will have the antigen on it that we're targeting when we use a, a non-personalised approach. So if we use CD19, there'll be some CD19 negative cells that can't be killed because we're not trying to kill them. And they'll just keep growing. Whereas if you're using a, a, a driver mutation, unless it was something you were born with, which in very, very few people, a TP53 mutation, for instance, you're very rarely born with it. Um, unless it was something you were born with, you could target every cell that was TP53 mutated. So you would be hitting every cell that had the root cause, whether it was cancer or not, and whether it looked like all the other cancer cells or not. And part of the theory of relapse is that when you, and this is you know, particularly for indolent disease, which are incurable, um, so they're not a problem of being rapidly growing and not being able to be turned off in time. If you've got an indolent disease, you have probably got a pool of what we call early progenitors that aren't B cells. They're not CD1920 positive. 
None of the therapies we give at the moment could possibly turn them off. And so if you could target the, the ones that had the mutations, regardless of what they looked like, you could get rid of those as well. Um, so I hope that answers your question, but we can talk after. Oh, anything else? We're good? Happy? Tricky, right? Um, okay, so that's the background. It's all very sort of novel and cool, but in terms of the practicalities on the ground, like, you know, we need to know where we're at. And they've spoken a lot about this, these things called penicillin points, which is where all of a sudden medicine just takes this huge step in the unknown and we've just got too many options to know how to focus our, inter our interests. CAR-T is one of them. CAR-T is a penicillin point. All of a sudden we've got this, like, new technique that we can do a billion things with. Um, and it's very likely that cancer vaccines will be similar. So um, penicillin point, this is Georgina Long. Uh, Georgina is a melanoma researcher in Sydney that I've worked with many times, and uh, Richard Scolia. So Georgina and Richard are the co-heads of the Melan Melanoma Institute in Australia. And they're fantastic researchers, both in their own rights and running that institute. Um, and they were um, both involved very heavily in the first mRNA vaccine for melanoma, which has now gone through phase two trials and looks very promising. Um, but in part, aside from their excellent clinical work, the reason that they were recently awarded the Australian of the Year, that's, that's them getting it, um, is because Richard, um, a, about 18 months ago, was actually diagnosed with a very, very difficult to treat brain tumour called glioblastoma, which has never been a research focus of the Australian Melanoma Institute. Um, but very quickly, they started applying all the lessons they'd learned from the development of an MRA vaccine in melanoma into this much more difficult to treat disease. Um, he was the, Richard was the first patient to be treated with an immune vaccine for glioblastoma um, in a cancer that's not resectable. So the, the goal is to, to resect this usually, but that, that's too big. Um, to resect initially. And so he got a combination of that vaccine plus some other really active therapies that we think help the way vaccines work, and we can touch on them later if you've got interest. Um, and, you know, the median survival of this is a couple of months, and he's now, so 12 or so months down the road, um, is continuing to work. It's a really impressive story about ingenuity in Australian medicine and also, um, you know, some of, the, some of the, the directions that we'll be taking these things in the future. And I think... Um, Australia is an environment that's going to really excel in this space. Um, PubMed is our largest database for academic, or, uh, academic uh, literature. So if you want to look up a paper um, as an academic, UQ pays for your access to PubMed. Um, and if you type in cancer vaccine, um, this goes back to like 1950. We've known cancer vaccine was a concept uh, for ages and we've never done anything with it. Um, and then in the last couple of years, it's just shot off. Um, and that's reflected not just in, you know, medical literature, but we're now starting to see this is the last three months of news. Like if you just go to Google News and type in cancer vaccine, you'll get 250, 300 hits if you go back three months. But there's phase three's, phase three, so end, like late bring to market trials in melanoma. Um, there's now one in GBM, in glioblastoma. There's one in pancreatic cancer. Um, there's another one in breast cancer. These, these are starting to hit really hard in the, in the academic space. And, um, you know, it's hard to believe that they're not going to progress very quickly into something that we start talking about, even though right now, you know, if you show up to a hematologist, they're not, they're not going to know anything about the prospects of these. So I guess the question really is, so where, where are all my lymphoma vaccines right now? Um, because we, we see them in melanoma and GBM and we're all very excited. Um, and there are some, and I won't go into the weeds with what this is trying to show you, um, but just to acknowledge that they're, they're more difficult. So uh, more difficult but promising. So this is a paper that was just published in low-grade lymphoma. The re reason we use low-grade lymphoma um, is partially because it's got this very uh, uh, similar biology to a normal, a normal lymph node. It, it's not that different. Uh, but the other reason is that it's, you've got time on your hands to be able to work up a vaccine, give it, and you don't have to worry that they're going to race away from you and be too sick to receive the drug. Um, so this is a bit of a different approach to vaccination, but I hope you'll be able to appreciate um, how it's similar. So this patient is actually getting just something called uh, CPG, which is a, an immune aggravator. You know sometimes you get a vaccine that really hurts? That's on purpose. 
um, we want the immune cells to know something's there so that they go there. Okay, so that's all CPG is. It's just the, just the aggravating bit. So there's no immune vaccine part of this. And they give a little bit of radiation. And radiation's got this, as much as it seems like this, like old, boring technique to treat cancer. Um, at low doses, it's actually a, a, what we'd call almost like an internal vaccine. It breaks the cells down in such a way that the antigens all just flow out, um, which lots of, lots of cancer therapies don't do. Um, and so when you give that, what they did in this uh, very interesting but very cumbersome trial is they injected CPG at several times throughout treatment uh, of this indolent lymphoma after radiation. And what they did was that, that was interesting is they measured the size at the site they were injecting and a site that they weren't touching at all. And what was fascinating is that even though this is not a tremendously impressive response, because no one got 100% resolution except for maybe this person, uh, is that in every single one of them, uh, the distal lesion also shrunk. So the lesion that they weren't touching at all was also shrinking. They, they're getting vaccinated. Their immune system is going there. And we just need to find ways to make that a viable product. So exciting, but difficult. And I want to touch briefly on what the difficulties are, um, because that's where I want to spend my time for the next 20 years. So the first thing is about the mutational burden. So we were saying that you know the, the, the mutants in the, in the genetics, that's what your, your immune system is able to find and, and attack. There's lots of them in some diseases, melanoma, lung. They're very high immune burden diseases, and that's why they've had lots of success with immunotherapies like checkpoint inhibitors and immunes and things, right? And we haven't. CLL, lymphoma, uh, myeloma, not so high, difficult, right? And we also have a competitive space where we do have treatments for these. So trickier to be able to find a neoantigen um, in these patients. And then also the environment they sit in is harder. So there's this concept of being a cold tumour, which is where even though you know exactly where the tumour is, um, there's no immune cells getting in there. And there's a whole bunch of ways that tumours actively keep cells out. And again, Dr. Hendon sort of touched on that, that sometimes even though you've got a perfectly good CAR T cell, you can't get it where you need it to go because the cancers are evolving ways to track it now. So these cold tumours are very common in lymphomas um, and you have to find ways to heat the tumour up, get the immune cells to actually flood in there. And that's what that CPG does. That's what that injection of that immune irritant does. There's lots of ways to do it. Radiation does it. Um, there's some adjuvants which you inject in. There's some viruses that can do it, which we're you know, very interested in, but are very early science. And there's some other therapies. So um, you know, there are drugs that just bring T cells into the immune environment. That's all they do. Um, and they're very effective on their own. They're probably more effective with a vaccine. So um, I'll show you just a little tiny bit of local research. And I don't expect you to digest the figures or anything, but um, just to show you, I guess this is two um, patients from uh, the Princess Alexandra Hospital. Same disease, same stage of disease, same age, pretty much. Um, and one of them has got this really extensive, these CD8 T cells, they're, they're the um, effector T cells that we keep talking about that do the cell killing. And this patient has got almost none. And if you actually look, maybe you can't see it back there, but there's these little follicles. That's what follicular lymphoma looks like. It's got these little patches. There's almost no T cells in there. So that's what this area is. So there's just no T cells getting in there. So even patient to patient, it's not just disease to disease, but patient to patient, we need to be able to know who's going to respond to a vaccine just on a can the immune system get there basis. Um, that's another slide. Oh, and we know that we can if we don't do anything to change this, those patients do worse no matter what therapy they get. So the patients that are cold, quote unquote, which I've annoyingly colored red, um, <laughs> these, these cold patients do much worse. So they're, they're like 10 year, um, you know, relapse free survivals in the sort of 30% range and the others are closer to 70%. So it's, it's a massive part of how we control lymphomas, whether we treat with an immune vaccine or not. The other thing is that we have got uh, a our research lab in a massive database of lymphoma samples. We've got over 700 follicular lymphomas. We've got over 1,000 diffuse large lymphomas. We've got about 2,000 Hodgkin's. Really good data. And what we've started doing is developing one of those pipelines, one of those complex algorithms that lets us pick which of these mutations are going to be important for the immune system to find. And what we're really interested in are high confidence in new engines. So things we're really confident the immune system will fight, but also that are shared amongst lots of different tumours 
because commercially you need that, right? Like you can't, you probably don't want to be making a vaccine every patient. You probably want to have 50 vaccines ready to go and then be able to pick and choose which ones you use. So particularly this one, KMT2D and follicular lymphoma, for instance, that's present in 70% of these cases and it's about half of DLBCLs. Um, it's pretty rare in um, Hodgkin's, but it's, it's around in some T-cell lymphomas as well. Um, so we're calling that now as an antigen. And then this, don't please don't uh, think that you should understand this one, but um, this is basically five different proteins that were mutant proteins, the KMT2D. And when we expose them to the patient's own immune cells, every single one of these black dots, um, in, this is just done in triplicate, um, so it's the same patient blood each time. Every single one of those black dots is a place where one of their immune systems is seeing that mutant protein and wanting to attack it. So if you had a patient who had that mutation and you were able to stimulate their blood, there are T cells there that should attack it. And so there's questions about why they're not doing that automatically. The, ch the tumour obviously has mechanisms we need to understand better to be able to get those cells there. But we have a lot of those tools now. Um, we have a lot of drugs that we didn't have five years ago that do change how well you can get these cells in. And so of the um, five of these KM2D, um, 2D mutations we tested, all five of them worked. This is a negative control, so that had nothing in it. And that's a positive control, that's a virus. So they, they all worked. Um, so this is very accessible, very real uh, science that you can turn into a therapy. We just need to figure out how to get it working well enough that it can go straight into trials. So. So that's kind of where the field is up to in lymphoma. There are other groups. I'm not the only person in the world thinking about this, but um, we all have the same general goals now. Uh, and just to summarise what they are, this is a dead cancer cell. That's a, that's a big one. Um, we need to be better at picking what these mutants are. So we're getting there. We've got the, science, like the, the computer science now to do it. We're starting to roll that out uh, on a regular basis so we can get big data sets examined. We need to figure out what it is in the microenvironment, the cells that surround the tumour, um, that, that stop these vaccines from working effectively um, and then overcome them. We've got some of the tools to do that, but we need to try which one's best. And then we need to find a good vaccine delivery device. And we spoke briefly, I mean, that's a ex really expansive field because of what we learned from COVID. So picking how we do those things most effectively in trials is going to be the harder part. It's not whether we bring vaccines to lymphoma, it's what combination of this like endless set of options we have will be the most effective. Um, yeah, so I think that's a bit of an early mark. Um, but yeah, very happy to take questions. That's obviously a lot to digest. Um, what do you got? <laughs> Let's go. Yeah, I'm starting to get a guilt complex. Huh? Um, I'll, I just, it, this is probably more a, a little bit of commentary and be a, a, a question that's probably not directly related to the illness per se. But it is around the research aspect and that, um, I guess, that future scoping. Um, I, I work for a, a global company, right? And the one thing that we don't often do well is shared learnings. Um, and, and we do it, uh, we do it, but there's lag. Mm. And given that there is multiple parties that would be working on variations of a theme, I guess my first question is orientated around do you have a sense of confidence in the real-time aspect of shared learnings around research uh, and how quickly that can translate? And then I guess as a, a, a secondary component to that, the age-old argument around private first public funding and the protection of some of this research in a, a, a commercialised sense versus the greater public good. Um, and is that an inhibitor or uh, appreciating that a lot of advancements in health mm. come through big pharma and others that have got big checkbooks to drive that so this is not a this is not a I'm not on a soapbox here it's just a, a curious question yeah. about um, for me information is key and yeah. a lot of the stuff that's been spoken about today is about research data information and I guess I always get concerned about how open we are mm. to sharing that, how quickly does that occur, and how quickly does that facilitate change? Mm. Mm. No, it's a great question. It's, you know what? It's something that I had no clear concept of either until the last couple of years. Like how, how 
what makes a drug go from being something that works in a mouse and something that maybe even works in early trials being something that, you know, pharma puts, you know, a half a billion dollars into to turn into a phase three trial? Um, it's, a, it's a really reasonable question. I don't know that I even have a full answer for you, but I'll tell you a couple of things. Um, the, the first thing I'd say is how well do we share data between academic sites? I mean, all this stuff starts in academia. Science, science is a funny thing. Um, we have to find our own money to do it. So we're constantly chasing grants. We have to pay to publish it, uh, typically. Um, we have to pay to read published data. And then pharma will buy or just take that information and turn it into a drug. So um, interestingly, um, you know, from an academic point of view, the, the reason for not sharing is because we need grants. Um, but as a general statement, uh, and this is particularly true of Australians, we all do better when we all share data. We're not a big enough country that we, we can be hiding things. Um, you know, the time I spent over at the MD Anderson, which is just an unimaginably big hospital, about 15 or 16 city blocks of hospital, um, is that we'll never outdo, we'll never out MD Anderson, the MD Anderson. You can't do it. Um, but there's nowhere in America that shares data. Um, and we've got some great collaborative groups. Um, Dr. Hannah and I have just got a grant um, off a clinical trial where we're just going to have open access data amongst Australian sites. Um, so we share these things all the time. I don't think in Australia where we're, we're all just here to get the most out of it and we, we accept that we've actually got some really specific needs in Australia um, that are to do with a public health care system, to do with our smaller population. Um, you know, we need to do research that's directed at our patients, not. In terms of, uh, in terms of like, you know, how do we get these things turned into a drug and paid for? Oh, your guess is as good as mine. A lot of things go line up. Like it's got to work, sure, and that's, that's great. But there have been immune vaccines in the past that have worked. And they've, they've sort of died in the commercial space. And that, that's a very hard question to answer because it's not just about does the drug work, it's does the drug work and turn a profit. It's about does the drug work and is feasible. I mean, CAR-T, by rights, it's just so impressive that it's gotten up. But by rights, it's too hard. It's too hard. The fact that it got up is incredible. Um, and it's just done that through sheer brilliance of the science. Um, it shouldn't otherwise in a commercial space get up. If you did the same thing that cost half a billion dollars, oh, sorry, half a million dollars per patient, took six weeks to give and proposed it as a tablet, you'd be laughed out of the place. Um. <laughs> I, I might just add something to the answer and, and for the once I may not be the most cynical person in the room, but um, <laughs> look, I, I, I go... I, one of the good things, I think there is still a good amount of information sharing. Um, the American Society of Hematology meeting is probably the peak data sharing meeting for all of this type of work. Um, that gets 30,000 people who go to share data because ultimately we do want to make things better for patients. So I think although there is some, you know, Josh has made some good points about, um, you know, you do need to, uh, you know, in order to get your research funded and things, you need, you need to have something that other people don't. But ultimately, nobody, particularly I think, people in our situation where we're, we're clinicians and, and researchers, no one does that because they think they're going to make a lot of money out of it or things. They do it because they ultimately want to make outcomes better. And so ultimately I, I would offer the counterpoint that in fact the information sharing for ultimately improving patient outcomes is what most of us do very well and that's how we've got to where we are today. Yeah, do you know any billionaire scientists? I've never met one. <laughs> no, it's, if you get into it for money, you've made a terrible choice. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, go on. Um, so yes. I guess my, ne my question was, when we look at, we're speaking about vaccines, uh, is that going to be what you would think as first-line treatment for people mm, down the track? That's a cool question. Further down the track? Yeah, what, well, I mean, everyone, e every good drug should be in the first line. You know, we all know that. And um, we, we can't do that because the way the trial pipeline works is that you have to make sure it works safely first and then move it forward. Um, Geez, it, different answer for different things. Um, my perfect answer would be that this, you, you would still give an induction therapy. You still have to get rid of the bulk very effectively and very quickly for most diseases. But then after that, you know that there's a chance of relapse. We can monitor for that in the blood on a molecular level. Um, and for patients either that show signs of having that molecular relapse or for patients who maybe don't show those signs, but we know that it inevitably will come back, like myeloma or follicular or CLL, um, that a, a maintenance, 
vaccine where you get one shortly after and then maybe you get some sort of immune booster thereafter. I think that's a fantastic model for something like this. Um, and then the other side of the coin, you know, uh, there'd be no reason that you couldn't have a CAR-T or a cell therapy of some sort that does all this hard work of getting rid of the bulk of tumour and also has these sort of, you know, smaller um, but, but essential mutations that it looks for as well. Um, so it's a wide open field. I don't think anyone could answer that well, but that, that's sort of my yeah. rough idea. And my second question was, I guess, in relation to this general myth data sharing, should we all be coming to the Royal or PA for our <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, 100%. 100%. So, so how do we transfer? Yeah. Um, uh, I think... Uh, or should we really be transferring? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. um, and, and Andrew and I have carved the city up. Uh, there are only two hospitals and we work at them. Uh, no, no, no. It, like, do you know the truth of it is that we... Um, we... It, in the US, yes. You know, in the US, there's probably 10 hospitals that are fantastic. And there are 40,000 hospitals that are pretty average. And they have a profit drive. And, you know, in Australia, we know what our hospitals are. We know what strengths they have and what trials they have. Um, and we all talk constantly. Like, there's only so many lymphoma researchers in Brisbane. We all know each other super well. Um, you know, most of us get a pint once, once a quarter. So, um, yeah, you don't have to be transferred uh, to a different hospital to receive exactly the same care. Um, and and we, we transfer for trials all the time. Thank you. You uh, showed a chart of the uh, tumour-specific antigens, if, if, if I interpreted that correctly. And I saw that... Um, Let's go. Further, uh, back further. Back further. You just say one. That one. This one. Yeah. Oop. Oops, gone again. Uh, so uh, melanoma and uh, lung, bladder, mm. if I interpret that correctly, they have a greater prevalence of, um, of tumour-specific antigens than, say, CLL or, or um, lymphoma. Is that my...? They, they have a greater prevalence of mutations. Mutations. The, it it okay. roughly carries. So, yeah. you know, okay. generally if you've got the most mutations, you probably have the most mutations that also could be vaccine, vaccinated against. Yeah. Uh, but they're not exactly the same thing. Um, yeah, um, but yes. So, so I was wondering where glioblastoma sits in that. Yeah, it's here. It's interesting, right? Oh, I missed it. Yeah, so it's right next to lymphoma. Okay. So it is an interesting so that's point. A, that's a promising it is. Um, yeah. indicator. Yeah, so you don't have to be up here for this to work. The, the science is the same the whole way through. Like, even if you've only got, like, one mutation in the whole cancer cell, which never happens, it takes more than that to cause a cancer, if that is a neoantigen, there's no reason that a, it couldn't be presented on an antigen-presenting cell, it couldn't be attacked by an immune cell. Um, the, the, problem, the problem is more difficult, and that's why I kind of alluded to the microenvironment at the end. The brain doesn't have a lot of uh, immune cells in it. So its microenvironment is quite... Um, permissive if you had a way to get things in there um, and act on the cancer cell there'd be there'd be nothing to compete with there'd be nothing nothing trying to dampen it down um, so that that's why and and I guess the other thing to say and this was true of melanoma 10 years ago it's an abysmal tumor it's an awful thing to have and we don't have good treatments whereas whereas with lymphomas and myelomas we have pretty good upfront treatments I think most people would say that um, you know in in the scheme of things from where we were in you know, the 1960s, lymphomas come a huge way and glioblastomas barely moved. So we try these things more readily there, whereas you'd have to be pretty, you know, you'd have, you'd have to have a really good reason to try a frontline vaccine, you know, against CHOP. Our CHOP's a pretty good drug relatively to what we deal with in GBM. Sorry, my uh, question's not really about vaccines or anything like that. Sure. But it just occurred to me during that. <laughs> anything, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, like, maybe other people have the same question. I've noticed in patients I've scanned, their indolent um, lymphoma has transformed. And mm. it just occurred to me then during your talk how and why that happens. Mm. Mm. Yeah, do you have time to talk about that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
How? Why does it happen? Uh, it is a complete black box why it happens. We know what, we tr what we're trying to answer right now is how could we know earlier? Because um, we have treatments for indolent disease. Just, oh, sorry, for, for anyone that doesn't know, know exactly the, the specific what we're talking about. Indolent lymphomas are slow growing. They tend, to, um, they tend to be something that you can just watch if it's not causing any trouble. Um, the life expectancy of them is very good and some of them even spontaneously remit. So we don't treat just because we see it. Sometimes we diagnose it and then we wait until we need to. Um, and indolent diseases do have this unfortunate characteristic where sometimes they just flick a switch and all of a sudden they race away. And those ones then have your typical cancer f you know, phenotype where it needs to be treated. It's growing very fast. If you don't treat it, it'll get into places it shouldn't be. So how do we, you know, what causes that switch? Um, it's, it's probably baked into the cake at the start. You probably have already transformed when we treat you with the first treatment. But that's not true all the time because some people transform 25 years down the line um, and it's pretty consistent. That it can happen the same rate per year. So um, that's a huge part of the research that we're doing um, that I haven't touched on at all. Um, but the, the goal would be uh, if you can identify them earlier um, that you could treat them with something that's more directed at that transformed group and not at the indolent group. So does it mean if you have transformed um, lymphoma that you will always have follicular lymphoma as well? And once you've been treated or you're transformed, where do you sit then with, do you still have follicular and are you likely to relapse with that? Yeah, Erica's geared you up with all my favourite questions. This is great. <laughs> this is great. This is right in my wheelhouse. So uh, you cannot get rid of the low-grade disease because you cannot get rid of the progenitor that's causing it, if that makes sense. So remember we were saying before that you probably have got this group of cells that don't look like B cells, which is what these lymphomas all are. They're, they're progenitor cells, they're stem cells. And they've got all the cancer machinery going, but they just haven't turned into a B cell yet. We don't see them. We don't know where they are. You're unlikely to ever be able to clear that with therapies as they work now. Um, you need something that you, you probably need something that's antigen directed is my belief. So as it stands right now, that could relapse at any, you know, follicular lymphoma can relapse and it, it, it will, that risk will be potentially there forever unless we find a different way to treat. The transformed disease can come back or it might be gone forever. So it's got curative potential. You can cure the transformed group. Um, but then, you know, that, that initial pool of cells could still just start growing. Um, generally speaking, um, if we cure transformed disease, so if you get treated for your transformed disease, you make it four years, we sort of think that you're probably not going to have that transformation come back, but that your lifetime risk of follicular will be the same as it was before the transformation. And if your follicular does come back, is it then likely to want to transform again if it's done that previously or not necessarily? No, not necessarily, no. So it's, um, it's, uh, it's kind of like you've got this foundation event and they, they acquire these new problems as they go. And one of them acquires a problem that just makes it relapse and grow slowly and you treat that and it goes away. And then another one comes out where it acquires a problem that makes it grow quickly and it's transformed and you treat that and it goes away. And then the next one's just, you know, it's another, another mystery item from the box. Um, but, item. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, can we all take five for the analogies that we're getting? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. Thanks to Kate, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> Any final questions? Uh, well, for me personally, <laughs> uh, you mentioned earlier yeah. you can see your, the rest of your, you know, professional life concentrating mm. on this aim. If that makes sense, mm. and I think you know, you said oh, in the next twenty years, mm. in a in a really realistic sense, is that the timeline or the time horizon to potentially where you see this science being of daily use or? I'll just unpop the question in the microphone as well, just so it's on the recording. So the question was, is um, there a time frame for when vaccinations will become available for lymphoma? Yeah. Um, aspirationally, no, it won't be 20 years. I mean, these, these are coming very quickly. And I, I think when you see these groundswells of 
technical advancements, they 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 grow very quick. You know, the market the market feeds it. Um, I I don't think that means that's where it'll end though. Like we sort of touched on the different ways you can do this. It's it's not going to be that the first one just knocks it out of the park. Will will be incremental change. You know, we saw that really sort of. Um, I mean, it's a great trial, but it was pretty rudimentary, right? It was like radiation and a bit of an immune stimulant. And that was awesome and it worked, but it's not good enough. So um, I can see the next 20 years building on that. And the same way that, you know, CAR-T is here and it's great, but that technology is so early and we've done so little out of what we could potentially do with it, you know, that that's, that field is, is here and it's available and it's going to be, you know, um, something that, I'm sure Dr. Hinden works on for the rest of Aircrate as well. Maybe not. What do you want to do? <laughs> so just di 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 um, in, in internalising all the information, a lot of this is to do with CLL, uh, B cell lymphomas and myelomas. Is there anything in the works in terms of classic Hodgkin's, for example, mm. just given a little bit of concern, majority of uh, ex-patients that I've met, luckily enough, haven't relapsed. But uh, we'll have stories of more aggressive Hodgkin's lymphomas. Is there anything mm. into the work with, with with the vaccines for that? It's so hard. It's so hard, Hodgkin's, for a bunch of reasons. Um, Hodgkin's got particularly low levels of mutation. It's got a particularly unusual microenvironment, um, you know, compared to all other lymphomas. It's 99.5% microenvironment. The cells are very rare. Um, and the other thing about Hodgkin's in the young is that it's got very good outcomes by and large. You know, we, we don't have many diseases where we, we think we've hit our ceiling for treatment without causing too much toxicity, which is like 95% of people, you know, getting exceptional outcomes. So it's, it's a really hard space to work in um, now, which is a great thing, right? Like it's great to see cancers that are so, we're getting so good at treating that we can't do research easily in them. Um, but I think they're probably going to be the hardest one to do in this space um, and it, you know, but at the same time, there's the same promise and maybe even some, some signs that they might be particularly active for immune therapies, which they already are, um, you know. So it, it's, it's the kind of thing that I think will evolve secondarily. I don't think it's going to be the first thing that we roll out with, vac with vaccines. And it's the same reason we don't have Hodgkin's cars quite yet um, in, in the commercial space. So, but, but definitely a, a priority. I mean, everyone's seen it. Or every lymphoma specialist I know has had a, a Hodgkin's that you just sort of say, oh, this will be cured, fantastic. And, you know, they come back in, it's just an absolute disaster for you. Any final questions? Thank you so much, Josh. It's okay. Such an interesting um, topic and presentation. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so that concludes our seminar for today. I'd like to just all, uh, if we could all um, say thank you again to our speakers. As I mentioned, they do volunteer their time to be here today. So thank you very much. I'd like to thank you all um, for coming. I know some people have travelled quite a distance to be here in person today. So thank you so much. And thank you for all of your really interesting questions as well. Um, I just wanted to let you know that if you do have any questions about Lymphoma Australia or any of our support services, please see myself or Erica um, after we conclude today. And the last thing, I'd just like to thank um, Erica for all of the work she put behind putting together, uh, putting, making today very accessible, ugh, can't even speak anymore, <laughs> making today successful and all the work she's done behind putting this together. So thank you, Erica. <laughs> The last thing I will ask you, um, there's a QR code on the screen at the moment. This is for our feedback form. Your feedback um, goes towards improving future seminars. It'll take two minutes of your time, so we would really appreciate if you could fill out that feedback form before you go. If you don't have a phone that reads QR codes, don't worry. You will be getting another email from me in the next week. <laughs> And that will be my final one for this seminar. So thank you so much all for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>